Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? You tried. How do the dead come back, Mother? What's the secret of the dead? The Secret of the Vault by J. Wesley Rosenquist What dread mystery lurked in that charnel chamber beneath the cellars of the old house, and what impious rites of life and death were performed there? I think it was in January that my suspicions first took form and grew. Prior to that, my uncle's visits to the family burial vault had only the appearance of actions natural to grief, and, as on all occasions he carried with him into the cold depths a candle and a missile, I presumed his intentions to be only the most pious. In all his words to me concerning the matters of the deceased, he exhibited a tender reverence and profound respect for those he called immortal spirits. As he said, and it was not until the recent death and burial of his wife, my aunt Helena, that he became aware and fully conscious of another world and the need of the dead for prayer. This I believed. Even had I suspected earlier, I could not disprove his words, as out of a timid heart, I had never ventured into the mortuary chambers deep below the cellar. From childhood I had held in my mind an image of supreme gruesomeness, in which the antique burial vaults in my childish imagination yawned like some ravenous maw, into which all who vanished never returned. In fancy I constructed a bottomless pit in which nightmarish forms of darkness crept and grew, a pit filled with forms instilled with a grim life that was an insult flung in the face of God and nature. Death itself had no terrors for me, but only those things which I conceived to be the offspring of death in the imagination-infested region of my childhood, which I associated inseparably with the vaults. During many of my earlier years, I dwelt morbidly on the subject of what happens to the deceased. Perversely, I gave no thought to paradise or the place where flew the immortal spirit, but rather reflected on the husk left behind and the possibility of an abnormal awareness, a sluggish and impotent life clinging thereto defying time and dissolution, impotent only in that it was static and could not manifest itself. I filled my boyish mind with terrible subjects. I had read, I think, in my twelfth year of suspended animation and wondered what was the difference between death from which there was return and death from which there was no return, and if there was an awareness of surroundings in the poor crumbling shell. I would stand at the head of the narrow, steep stone stairway, holding the heavy oaken door wide open and ready to flee in an instant, gazing fearsomely into a darkness that defied my penetrating stare, and I felt that my gaze was reciprocated. I was above all things conscious of a curious air of watchfulness that seemed to justify my intuition of an unnatural vitality residing in those who dwelt there. I knew that there was not mere annihilation, but a transformation into something that was neither annihilation nor true life, a vitality that oozed from and through the dissolving shells, thriving amidst decay and darkness with sickening tenacity. Then, when some member of my once large family descended the narrow stairway, I stood with fixed and fascinated stare straining to catch a glimpse of the nitrous interior, but seeing only the damp, grey-gleaming walls of a passageway that led still further down. And always the feeble reflections of the taper would yield once more to darkness as the visitant progressed into the vaults, so that it seemed that the ravening moor was indeed filled, satisfied. As I grew older, I witnessed the fateful procession of my family into the vaults. So it came about finally that those who frequented the grim limbo that filled my early years with a superstitious terror failed to return from the black depths below the basement. The living, who had descended so often to pray for the already departed, themselves surrendered to the encroachment of death on the domain of the living. I personified the vaults as a creeping form, a restless entity 
burrowing beneath the big old house, waiting patiently for the stream of the living that passed as inevitably into the still chambers as the stars progressed in their courses. I often wondered if we do not commit a terrible error by not cremating the dead. Instead, they are placed in vaults and coffins as things no longer animate without feeling or consciousness. They are put away whole and intact as they died, and time wreaks its will upon them. Perhaps we are mistaken to think that life departs abruptly and completely from the mortal frame, and there's greatly an error to attempt to draw a distinct line between organic and inorganic, sentient and insentient, living and dead. There are certainly degrees of life and vitality in human beings, in all cases, then, does this vitality depart sharply and cleanly instead of ebbing away slowly after the abrupt slump called death? The fact that the bodies of saints so often remain intact for long years has led me to suspect that they do not enjoy their heavenly reward as soon as might be expected after death. There are many cases of suspended animation or catalepsy, at times the victims awake before they are interred and are saved from live burial. Others are not so fortunate. Who can say where catalepsy tapers off into deeper shades or, or tones of death? And how deep may the deceased descend into the clouded abyss? If vitality is a fluid, how many drops cling to the interior of the vessel when it is emptied? My aunt Helena was a vigorous woman. She was not very tall or heavy or muscular, and yet she possessed that strange force or essence called vitality in superabundance. How can we define this? Neither physiology nor chemistry could ever explain what it was that she, more than anyone else I knew except my uncle, emanated continuously during her busy life. I have heard that the human organism animates a fluid or force deadly to certain minute organisms and capable of affecting delicate instruments. I wonder if this fluid is identical with what is called the soul. Horrible thought. If this is so, the soul must be divisible. It is then constantly radiating out into space, leaving its traces here and there, like this slimy trail left behind by the snail. Where is immortality, then? For when the restraining vessel disintegrates, the fluid flows away in all directions and evaporates. My aunt was a fair, light-haired, blue-eyed woman. Her features were fine and delicately proportioned, and her form willowy. Therefore, when I speak of her abounding vitality, I think not of the crude strength of the peasant woman, but the subtle radiations of the full moon the glow of subterranean fires, the concealed potency of the magnet, and the incorporeal energy of the winds. She was the paragon of force and magnetism, of energy that was not born of bone or muscle. She emanated a persuasive magnetism that influenced all about her, a will that bent all before like wind in the wheat fields. Life seemed to flow from her high white forehead and her slender fingertips. She was constantly in the best health, and never seemed subject to the maladies that sweep the frail human frame. Her day was filled with activity from dawn to sunset. I remember her today not as she appeared in the lily glow about the beer, but as she used to move about through the house and in the gardens, leaving her impress on the very walls, her breath on the flowers and shrubs. It was a great shock when she died suddenly on a chill December night without warning and without apparent cause. The family physician ascribed her demise to heart failure, but I believed, I knew, that this verdict was a mockery. It was impossible that she had died from a heart ailment as she had never shown symptoms of such a malady. Later, I was to understand. If her death was a shock to me, it was an even greater shock to my uncle, so it seemed, for she was the centre of his universe. Where formerly there were three of us in the great house, there were now only two. The house became suddenly and completely empty, cold, cheerless. Under my aunt's hands it had slowly acquired, during the years after the death of my parents, a warmth and vitality 
that it must certainly have absorbed from her. The furniture gleamed, ornaments sparkled, the fire burned with fierce joy in the great fireplace. After her death the gleam and the sparkle and the joy suddenly went out like an extinguished candle, plunging the house into a gloom that weighed down on the roof. All the life and vitality that the place had absorbed under Aunt Helena's care departed with her was imprisoned in the coffin, casting a last glow on the massed white lilies, and flowed away into the burial vaults like water seeking its lowest level, leaving its former level bleak and dry. Was it for this reason that after her death the vaults acquired a new, shall we call it, life? To me, the pitch-black mortuary chambers below the cellar took on a new atmosphere, a new significance. The darkness squirmed, thrived with life, seemed to course fluidly through the grimly tenanted subterranean rooms. It was not the same pit of my childhood, where formerly I felt only a sluggish, terrible awareness lurking in the abysmal obscurity of the vaults, there was now an abounding vitality, a burning flame of unexampled brightness, as the torch dims the fitful glow of the ignis fatus. It was Aunt Helena who I knew was resisting somehow the sharp fang of the conqueror worm with the superhuman vital force that must have dwelt latent, not destroyed, in her still form, pushing outward against its concrete prison. After her death, I was again subjected to the morbid fascination of my childhood days. I stood in fright and awe at the head of the steep, narrow stone stairway, gazing into the well of darkness at the foot of the damp, mossy steps. I did this often, the strange spell holding me with a grip of iron, and still... I did not dare to descend. I stood ready to flee in an instant, holding the ponderous oaken door wide on its massive copper hinges, powerless to descry anything in the gloomy recesses of the vaults, and indeed not knowing what I should expect to see, and I felt undeniably the presence of Helena, as always I felt where I couldn't see. Uncle Henry seemed grief-stricken, which was to be expected. Yet I say seemed. I remember his eye and composure at the funeral, and the placing of the coffin in the vault, I watching on and not daring to follow the slow procession of pallbearers headed by my uncle, who carried candelabra to light the precipitous descent and the murky path. Then later I observed him in the library by the fireplace, his head unbowed, the heavy odour of lilies filled the air, the wind whispered drearily outside the windows, Light and shadow writhed on the walls like a misty simulacrum of Tartarean vistas. Still, he sat there, surrounded by a subtle aura of confidence, of expectation. How was I to guess so soon? In the days that followed, in the weeks that grew out of them, I observed with growing curiosity my uncle's excessively frequent visits to the tomb always with the missile and single candle. As often as once a day I saw his heavy muscular form descending into the blackness with slow and steady steps. In the weeks following the death of his wife, my uncle's bearing and demeanour became more and more confident and expectant, quite different from his earlier assumed air of resignation to the will of God. His vigils beside the tomb of Helena were frequent, as I have said, yet he returned each time from the vaults with the utmost composure, with ill-concealed confidence on his rugged face, although I did not perceive this immediately. In the latter days of January, he was almost cheerful. He moved with a brisk step, yet with a great air of mystery. Still, I suspected nothing. For whenever we spoke with each other, the restrained, sadness-tinged tones of his voice dispelled such perplexity as had grown from observation of his actions. The first intimation of horror that I received came to me one evening in the hushed atmosphere of his private library, to which no one but him and Aunt Helena had ever had access. He had always spent a considerable part of each day in his room and in his library, on two occasions only had I ever caught a glimpse of the ceiling-high shelves, a glimpse and no more. 
Naturally, I had always felt curiosity about the book-lined room. One day, my curiosity was to receive more satisfaction than I had bargained for. It was on a Sunday, and I had already seen my uncle disappear down the slippery steps into the strangely vibrant darkness. It was on my way to the study that I halted beside the door of Uncle Henry's private library. Who can say what it was that impelled me to try the doorknob? Perhaps it was the old curiosity, perhaps it was caprice, or perhaps I was prompted by something deeper. Then it was that I received the first intimation in that heavily silent environment. On the shelves was a staggering collection of books, which I perceived immediately with growing apprehension, dealt with subjects I felt to be violently incompatible with his professed religious views. Words cannot express my shock, my bewilderment, my doubt upon examining the numerous volumes. Many were inscribed in Latin and were of great antiquity. Those I could not read, however, usually contained remarkable and grotesque diagrams and drawings, interlaced triangles, squares and circles, and charts of the human anatomy covered with astrological and cabalistic symbols appeared frequently in these works. Then, too, there were those books that I could read, and I proceeded to do so at the cost of completely lost equilibrium. Picking out a heavy leather-bound volume, I opened it and began to read. My fright was great. Consider, for example, the following. It is said among the Greeks, said the paragraph, it was apparently translated from Latin, that in an impenetrable mountain fastness in the northeast, where Rome's legions have not yet penetrated, dwells a scattered people whose priests and physicians are unexcelled in necromancy and the control of the elements. Frightened and starved travellers have returned from this mountain region with strangely similar tales, accounts of the raising of the dead and of lightning and wind called out of the heavens are frequent. It has also been said that these people stand unclothed in bitter cold and melt ice and snow around them with the breath of their bodies. It seems that these strange people, whoever they may be, are the custodians of a very great fund of superhuman wisdom and hold the keys to many arcana. The tree-worshipping priests of Britannia and the black men of the southern continent hold no power such as these. The soothsayers of the Greeks and the oracles of Delphi are acquainted with mere child's games. When one considers the many times confirmed accounts of the occult might of these people, the above, however, was the least of the abominations that I found. It took on the appearance of a mere dissertation on the customs of foreign peoples in strange places compared to that which next occupied my dazed brain, next absorbed my horror-filled intensity of concentration. Opening a large leather-bound tome at random, I read, It is therefore apparent that each soul possesses inherent in itself to effect its own resurrection, a capacity for the special vital fluid possessed by the human organism a thousandfold greater than the crude, earthy strength of the animal world. In the human being alone is the solar force specialized, differentiated, into what might be called mental or spiritual vital force in contradistinction to the physical vitality of animals and the sluggish animation of vegetable life. In this respect, men are the vessels of power, the most exalted receptacles of the precious fluid that flows from the plerium, of the golden dew of pleroma, otherwise known to men as anima mundi. Behold then how each man may resurrect his own body according to the archetype of Christos and triumph over the destroyer of forms. The secret lies in this that he who aspires to an ending length of days must invoke that power known as the preserver. And the secret is that each man is his own preserver. By knowledge of the proper means, therefore, one may overthrow the night-clothed and ravening devourer which forces its way into the most secret tomb, the most cleverly concealed vault, to gnaw at the husk 
therein. The soul may wrench itself from the smothering embrace of night, from the detestable bosom of decay, from the cold and slimy suck of chaos, and radiant and triumphant emerge from the gaping entrance of its shattered prison, invested with immortality of the body. For it is a terrifying truth. There is no other immortality. That which men call the immortality of the spirit is a dim dream, and the soul without a body flits like a will-o'-the-wisp from star to star. Certain oriental peoples have a method of arousing the dead wherein the veins of the body are opened and the corpse is cudgeled violently with sticks and flogged with whips, so that a frantic, convulsive and temporary revivication is brought about. This is hardly to be admired, or less yet, to be indulged in, for it is not true immortality, and is a cruel disappointment to the eager, reawakened entity to which the body belongs. There is a more subtle, sure method, however, by which animation may be restored to the dead, provided that the period of latency in the tomb does not exceed seven days, or slightly more or less than that figure. The blasphemous tract thereupon gave minute directions for the raising of the dead. It spoke confidently, in the utmost detail, about the necessary measures. The arrangement of senses and diagrams of candles and emblems above and around the tomb, and the intricate, sonorous mantras to be intoned daily in the funereal environs, accompanied by slow-traced diagrams and signs in the air. I closed the book slowly, confusedly, my fingers trembling with a dawning fear. Then I placed the volume back in its proper place, extinguished the light, and fled from the library, closing the door swiftly, silently behind me. As I hurried to my room, I heard slow, heavy footsteps ascending the stairs from the cellar. I considered myself fortunate indeed to have escaped observation, as a terrible suspicion had crept into my mind concerning the true purpose of my uncle's vigils in the vaults. In the seemingly endless days that followed my intrusion into the locked library of my uncle, it was only with almost superhuman exertion of will that I concealed from him, in word or even general bearing, the fact that I had received the first intimation of abnormality in his daily actions, the fact that I had penetrated into the monstrous repository of occult knowledge into which he withdrew daily for study that did not pursue the conventional paths of learning, I would not have succeeded in this deception had I known the measure in which he was succeeding in necromancy, though it must be understood that my suspicions were still so unformed that I could not assign any definite purpose to his frequent descents into the funereal chambers deep below the house. I observed my uncle's actions thereafter with such intensity that his failure to feel my gaze was miraculous. This concentration brought to my attention things I had failed to observe before, such as long bulges beneath his clothing, betokening, as I was later to discover, a candle made for ceremonial purposes, and small packages that left in the air fragrant trails of sandalwood and frankincense. Always, however, he carried with him the single candle, the weighty missal, which repeated action became obnoxious to me, as I now knew that he had no need or use for a book of orthodox prayer. It seemed to me at times that I could also hear faint echoes of my uncle's voice in the depths below, a voice whose timbre had acquired a new significance. What was it that caused him to become so negligent of his actions in those last few days? What inspired the carelessness that led to my ultimate discovery of the events that had been going on in the vaults? Truly, it was merciful that the truth became known to me bit by bit, rather than in one moment that would have cost me my sanity. First, there was his curiously confident, expectant air as he emerged daily from the vaults. Then followed the discovery of the library and of the packages that he carried with him into the depths. And finally, that last day, I found a diary which led to the ultimate climax of revelation in the subterranean rooms into which I finally dared to descend.
entering my uncle's room unbidden, while he was absorbed in his daily subterrene vigil, I found a diary on his dresser. Without knowing what to expect, I opened and read. December 23rd. It is now seven days after the internment of Helena, and I have begun the rites of preservation which are necessary to preserve the temple from destruction, for it will be many days before the marble chrysalis yields up its precious secret, before the final and glorious resurrection of her who lies so pallid but adamant within. I doubt that the rites could recall her to me without her own innate power of resurrection. The force she had in life, she now has in death subdued and concealed, but flouting conqueror worm with sublime persistency. How can I express the deep humility I feel upon observing daily her imperishable form, white and spotless, unmarked by the tooth of time? In tender reverence and awe I am compelled to genuflect before her quiet immortality, her adamant but subdued and gentle will to life. Her hair seems to flow like a golden river in the darkness of the vault, and a faint nimbus clothes her resisting flesh in a secret and an earthly glamour. Her blue gem eyes are now softly veiled by white rose lids, but they shall soon open. I tremble in passion like a leaf in a gale as I stand daily in the circle of glowing tapers, intoning magical syllables in the hushed atmosphere, swinging the censer rhythmically, while her still form is wreathed in plumes of pungent frankincense and sandalwood. What a strange passion I am filled with when I view her dormant beauty. It seems to me that now she is more desirable, being for the moment beyond my reach, and I, a humble votary, wreathe the marble goddess with incense. What a strange feeling. I am sure she is aware of my presence, though... She is truly dead. I feel some strange and super-mundane breath of air flow from the sepulchre as out of vast spaces. A foolish thought. It is as still as death down there, as still as death can be. There is only silence and darkness, and Helena waits patiently in the midst of her gruesome company until the day shall arrive when she strides forth from the tomb the burning incense drops for the moment a veil before her radiance. December 21st The past days have been filled with a sweet anxiety, an ecstatic impatience. Although I repeat the mantras precisely and trace the diagrams unfailingly, it seems to me that I am not the occult scientist I thought myself, but a bereaved spouse frantically imploring rather than demanding the return of his loved one. At the end of the ceremony, I unfailingly kneel in adoration before the sepulchre, while my hot and quickened breath congeals on the grey stone. Grey, grey, grey stone covered with sweat and nitre, the enclosing darkness. These I could not bear but for the presence of Helena. Her calm demeanour soothes and refreshes me immeasurably. How cosmic her thoughts must be! How superhuman and unearthly her mood as she lies there. January the 2nd. The supermundane wind again. I feel it flow from the shrouded recesses of the vault, and yet the candles do not flicker, the plumes of incense do not waver. But I think I understand now. It is the breath of anima mundi. It is the stirring of the breath of life. It is a psychic wind and has its origin nowhere on earth, although it flows through Helena, who is a gate ajar to the interstellar forces and the thronging multitudes beyond the veil of matter. Hasten. January 1st. How long must I wait? How long must we wait? O oh, cruel time, thy fangs are sharp, they bite deeply. And although thy strength is nothing against her, thy tooth has torn my heart. Helena, doubt, prayer. Incantations waiting, incense mingling with the musty effluvium of the tomb, pungent, aromatic. Seven candles tall and quietly burning, coloured diagrams in chalk on dank grey stone. Silence. 
silence. Then the sonorous chant of resurrection. When will it end? Perhaps, but God preserve me, I dare not doubt. Until now, I have had naught but the utmost confidence in the revelations of Ibn Khanu in his work, Death and Resurrection. I must not now doubt the potency of the mantras and the symbols, nor Helena's own indomitable will. Long days and weeks have passed since her death, while I have spent every day either beside her tomb or in my library, learning how to hasten the transformation of the human chrysalis, how to break the sooner the marble and mortar cocoon. Endless incantations, dozens of ceremonial candles, a fortune in rare frankincense. What are all these to the price Helena and I would pay if I failed? Her sacrifice was sublime. She was not informed as I was to the occult law of ages. She knew nothing of the greater arcana, yet she consented so readily, so willingly, with such sublime confidence in my ability to bring her forth again from the tomb. Not the slightest remonstrance, not the least doubt, and of fear there was none. But I explained to her my intention, my glorious purpose of immortality on earth, and though she did not understand fully, she bowed her head and gave her consent sweetly. She knew what she was to do that night at the table, and she did it without hesitation, faced death without fear. Two brownish drops in the wine I placed at dinner, bitter. She drank it swiftly. Helena! Hours later I stumbled up flights of stairs, raced in engulfing fear through the empty house, through long, silent corridors that seemed without end, through great hushed rooms wherein a strange animation seemed to have sprung up, past fireplaces leaping with fiery life and walls alive with writhing shadows, through portals that seemed to fly open before my approach in a terror of their own and out into the cold January air. Snow was falling outside, thick and fast. I fled up the side of a hill, and reaching the summit paused there, while my gaze rested on the huge rambling house below, from which I had just flung myself in an overwhelming excess of terror. Beneath me it lay like a slumbering behemoth, while the dull greyness of the walls and the roof was transformed into a living, gleaming white, and the light within blazed brazenly, triumphantly out over the rime-blanketed earth. Light sprang into fiery fire in every window lit by an unseen incendiary. The great snow-bleached structure became suddenly vibrant with light, life. The howling night wind shrieked triumphantly, and my mind projected itself once more inside. The pageant of past minutes rose up before me. Gone now was all the old terror of my childhood, replaced by an overwhelming, torturing curiosity. Dazedly, hardly realising what I was doing, I opened the ponderous oaken door slowly, silently on its well-oiled copper hinges. With silent tread, and with a pace of funereal slowness and deliberation, I descended the precipitous grey, dank steps. Dark, wet walls loomed up on either side, and thick blackness lay before me at the bottom of the descent. A cold, clammy breath blew in my face from the rambling chambers and corridors into which I was venturing at last, heavily laden with the odour of freshly burned incense. And as I reached the bottom of the stone stairway, and stood quivering in the frigid exhalation of the vault, there beat against my ears the strangely arousing syllables of a low-pitched, vibrant chant. It roamed through the obscurity of the chambers and smote my attentive ears with a peculiar, invigorating quality. Still hardly realising that I had made the fearsome descent into this chill limbo, I proceeded through the twisting corridor unhesitatingly, as if my feet and legs were inspired with a volition and animation of their own. Suddenly I came to a turn in the corridor, and there, spread before me, the first room. Within a circle of seven candles whose light beat with visible pulsations against the enclosing darkness, within a complex diagram made with chalk on the wet flagstones, 
wrapped in clouds and plumes of incense arising from three censers, knelt my uncle, gazing with a fearful concentration into the recessed vault immediately in front of him. The last syllables flowed from his lips, and then he uttered softly, reverently, yet passionately, Helena, Helena. I had halted there at the turn in the passageway, frozen in statuesque immobility, while comprehension dawned luridly on my dazed mind, while the blood withdrew violently from my face, the strength from my limbs, the first courage from my sadly leaping heart. Myself unseen, I watched the mute unfolding of the ultimate climax. My extremities grew cold, my head flushed again with blood, then blanched once more. My pulse raced violently, swiftly. I seemed suddenly suspended in the outer depths of space while the earth dwindled beneath me like a punctured balloon. My consciousness reeled but fortunately did not leave me, so that I was able to creep from the corridor to the stairs and up them to the silent quarters above in abject fear. I heard my uncle's expectant cry and would have turned and fled. Too late. Aunt Helena emerged from the vault slowly, quietly, with a queer delicacy. I never returned to that house. The Nameless Offspring by Clark Ashton Smith Many and multiform are the dim horrors of Earth, infesting her ways from the prime they sleep beneath the unturned stone. They rise with the tree from its roots. They move beneath the sea and in subterranean places. They dwell in the inmost Adita. They emerge betimes from the shuttered sepulchre of haughty bronze and the low grave that is sealed with clay. There may be some that are long known to man, and others as yet unknown that abide the terrible latter days of their revealing. Those which are the most dreadful and the loathliest of all are happily still to be declared. But among those that have revealed themselves aforetime and have made manifest their veritable presence, there is one which may not openly be named for its exceeding foulness. It is that spawn which the hidden dweller in the vaults has begotten upon mortality. From the Necronomicon of Abdul al Hazred. In a sense, it is fortunate that the story I must now relate should be so largely a thing of undetermined shadows, of half-shaped hints, and forbidden inferences. Otherwise, it could never be written by human hand or read by human eye. My own slight part in the hideous drama was limited to its last act, and to me its earlier scenes were merely a remote and ghastly legend. Yet even so, the broken reflex of its unnatural horrors has crowded out in perspective the main events of normal life has made them seem no more than frail gossamers woven on the dark windy verge of some unsealed abyss, some deep, half-open charnel, wherein earth's nethermost corruptions lurk and fester. The legend of which I speak was familiar to me from childhood as a theme of family whispers and head-shakings, for Sir John Tremoth had been a schoolmate of my father but I had never met Sir John, had never visited Tremoth Hall till the time of these happenings which formed the final tragedy. My father had taken me from England to Canada when I was a small infant. He had prospered in Manitoba as an apiarist, and after his death the bee ranch had kept me too busy for years to execute a long-cherished dream of visiting my natal land and exploring its rural byways. When finally I set sail, the story was pretty dim in my memory, and Tremoth Hall was no conscious part of my itinerary when I began a motorcycle tour of the English counties. 
In any case, I should never have been drawn to the neighbourhood out of morbid curiosity, such as the frightful tale might possibly have evoked in others. My visit, as it happened, was purely accidental. I had forgotten the exact location of the place, and did not even dream that I was in its vicinity. If I had known, it seems to me, that I should have turned aside, in spite of the circumstances that impelled me to seek shelter, rather than intrude upon the almost demoniacal misery of its owner. When I came to Trimorth Hall, I had ridden all day, in early autumn, through a rolling countryside with leisurely winding thoroughfares and lanes. The day had been fair with skies of pale azure above noble parks that were tinged with the first amber and crimson of the following year. But toward the middle of the afternoon, a mist had come in from a hidden ocean across low hills and had closed about me with its moving phantom circle. Somehow, in that deceptive fog, I managed to lose my way to miss the milepost that would have given me my direction to the town where I had planned to spend the ensuing night. I went on for a while, at random, thinking that I should soon reach another crossroad. The way that I followed was little more than a rough lane and was singularly deserted. And the fog had darkened and drawn closer, obliterating all horizons. But from what I could see of it, the country was one of heath and boulders, with no sign of cultivation. I topped a level ridge and went down a long, monotonous slope as the mist continued to thicken with twilight. I thought that I was riding toward the west, but before me, in the one dusk, there was no faintest gleaming or flare of colour to betoken the drowned sunset. A dank odour that was touched with salt, like the smell of sea marshes, came to meet me. The road had turned at a sharp angle, and I seemed to be riding between downs and marshland. The night gathered with an almost unnatural quickness, as if in haste to overtake me, and I began to feel a sort of dim concern and alarm, as if I had gone astray in regions that were more dubious than an English county. The fog and twilight seemed to withhold a silent landscape of chill, deathly, disquieting mystery. Then, to the left of my road, and a little before me, I saw a light that somehow suggested a mournful and tear-dimmed eye. It shone among blurred, uncertain masses that were like trees from a ghostland wood. A nearer mass, as I approached it, was resolved into a small lodge building, such as would guard the entrance of some estate. It was dark and apparently unoccupied. Pausing and peering, I saw the outlines of a wrought iron gate in a hedge of untrimmed yew. It all had a desolate and forbidding air, and I felt in my very marrow the brooding chillness that had come in from the unseen marsh in that dismal, ever-coiling fog. But the light was promise of human nearness on the lonely downs, and I might obtain shelter there for the night or at least find someone who could direct me to a town or inn. Somewhat to my surprise, the gate was unlocked. It swung inward with a rusty grating sound, as if it had not been opened for a long time, and, pushing my motorcycle before me, I followed a weed-grown drive toward the light. The rambling mass of a large manor house disclosed itself among the trees and shrubs whose artificial forms like the hedge of ragged yew, were assuming a wilder grotesquerie than they had received from the hand of the topiary. The fog had turned into a bleak drizzle. Almost groping in the gloom, I found a dark door at some distance from the window that gave forth the solitary light. In response to my thrice-repeated knock, I heard at length the muffled sound of slow dragging footfalls. The door was opened with a gradualness that seemed to indicate caution or reluctance, and I saw before me an old man bearing a lighted taper in his hand. His fingers trembled with palsy or decrepitude, and monstrous shadows flickered behind him in a dim hallway and touched his wrinkled features as with the flitting of ominous bat-like wings. 
What do you wish, sir? he asked. The voice, though quavering and hesitant, was far from churlish, and did not suggest the attitude of suspicion and downright inhospitality which I had begun to apprehend. However, I sensed a sort of irresolution or dubiety, and as the old man listened to my account of the circumstances that had led me to knock at that lonely door, I saw that he was scrutinizing me with a keenness that belied my first impression of extreme senility. I knew you were a stranger in these parts, he commented, when I had finished. But might I inquire your name, sir? I'm Henry Chaldane. Are you not the son of Mr. Arthur Chaldane? Somewhat mystified, I admitted the ascribed paternity. You resemble your father, sir. Mr. Chaldane and Sir John Tremoth were great friends in the days before your father went to Canada. Will you not come in, sir? This is Tremoth Hall. Sir John has not been in the habit of receiving guests for a long time, but I shall tell him that you are here, and it may be that he will wish to see you. Startled and not altogether agreeably surprised at the discovery of my whereabouts, I followed the old man to a book-lined study whose furnishings bore evidence of luxury and neglect. Here he lit an oil lamp of antique fashion with a dusty painted shade and left me alone with the dustier volumes and furniture. I felt a queer embarrassment, a sense of actual intrusion, as I waited in the wan yellow lamplight. There came back to me the details of the strange, horrific, half-forgotten story I had overheard from my father in my childhood years. Lady Agatha Trimoth, Sir John's wife in the first year of their marriage, had become the victim of cataleptic seizures. The third seizure had apparently terminated in death, for she did not revive after the usual interval and displayed all the familiar marks of the rigor mortis. Lady Agatha's body was placed in the family vaults, which were of almost fabulous age and extent, and had been excavated in the hill behind the manor house. On the day following the interment, Sir John, troubled by a queer, insistent doubt as to the finality of the medical verdict, had re-entered the vaults in time to hear a wild cry, and had found Lady Agatha sitting up in her coffin. The nailed lid was lying on the stone floor, and it seemed impossible that it could have been removed by the struggles of the frail woman. However, there was no other plausible explanation, though Lady Agatha herself could throw little light on the circumstances of her strange resurrection. Half-dazed and almost delirious, in a state of dire terror that is easily understandable, she told an incoherent tale of her experience. She did not seem to remember struggling to free herself from the coffin, but was troubled mainly by recollections of a pale, hideous, unhuman figure which she had seen in the gloom on awakening from her prolonged and deathlike sleep. It was the sight of this face, stooping over her as she lay in the open coffin, that had caused her to cry out so wildly. The thing had vanished before Sir John's approach, fleeing swiftly. To the inner vaults, and she had formed only a vague idea of its bodily appearance. She thought, however, that it was large and white and ran like an animal on all fours, though its limbs were semi-human. Of course, her tale was regarded as a sort of dream or a figment of delirium induced by the awful shock of her experience, which had blotted out all recollection of its true terror. But the memory of the horrible face and figure had seemed to obsess her permanently, and was plainly fraught with associations of mind-unhinging fear. She didn't recover from her illness, but lived on in a shattered condition of brain and body, and nine months later she died, after giving birth to her first child. Her death was a merciful thing, for the child, it seemed, was one of those appalling monsters that sometimes appear in human families. The exact nature of its abnormality was not known, though frightful and divergent rumours had purported to emanate from the doctor, nurses and servants who had seen it. Some of the latter had left Tremoth Hall and had refused to return after a single glimpse of the monstrosity. 
After Lady Agatha's death, Sir John had withdrawn from society, and little or nothing was divulged in regard to his doings or the fate of the horrible infant. People said, however, that the child was kept in a locked room with iron-barred windows, which no one but Sir John himself ever entered. The tragedy had blighted his whole life, and he had become a recluse, living alone with one or two faithful servants and allowing his estate to decline grievously through neglect. Doubtless, I thought, the old man who had admitted me was one of the remaining servitors. I was still reviewing the dreadful legend, still striving to recollect certain particulars that had almost passed from memory when I heard the sound of footsteps, which, from their slowness and feebleness, I took to be those of the returning manservant. However, I was mistaken, for the person who entered was plainly Sir John Tremoth himself, the tall, slightly bent figure, the face that was lined as if by the trickling of some corrosive acid, were marked with a dignity that seemed to triumph over the double ravages of mortal sorrow and illness. Somehow, though I could have calculated his real age, I had expected an old man, but he was scarcely beyond middle life. His cadaverous pallor and feeble tottering walk were those of a man who is stricken with some fatal malady. His manner, as he addressed me, was impeccably courteous and even gracious, but the voice was that of one to whom the ordinary relations and actions of life had long since become meaningless and perfunctory. Harper tells me that you're the son of my old school friend, Arthur Chaldane, he said. I bid you welcome to such poor hospitality as I'm able to offer. I have not received guests for many years, and I fear you will find the hall pretty dull and dismal, and will think me an indifferent host. And nevertheless, you must remain, at least for the night. Harper has gone to prepare dinner for us. You're very kind, I replied. I, I fear, however, that I am intruding. If I... Not at all, he countered firmly. You must be my guest. It's, it's miles to the nearest inn, and the fog is changing into a heavy rain. Indeed, I'm glad to have you. You must tell me all about your father and yourself at dinner. In the meanwhile, I'll try to find a room for you, if you'll come with me. He led me to the second floor of the manor house, and down a long hall with beams and panels of ancient oak. We passed several doors, which were doubtless those of bedchambers. All were closed and one of the doors was reinforced with iron bars heavy and sinister as those of a dungeon cell. Inevitably, I surmised that this was the chamber in which the monstrous child had been confined, and also I wondered if the abnormality still lived. After a lapse of time that must have been nearly thirty years, how abysmal, how abhorrent, must have been its departure from the human type to necessitate an immediate removal from the sight of others, and what characteristics of its further development could have rendered necessary the massive bars on an oaken door which by itself was strong enough to have resisted the assault of any common man or beast? Without even glancing at the door, my host went on, carrying a taper that scarcely shook in his feeble fingers. My curious reflections as I followed him were interrupted with nerve-shattering suddenness by a loud cry that seemed to issue from the barred room. The sound was a long, ever-mounting ululation, infra-bass at first like the too-muffled voice of a demon, and rising through abominable degrees to a shrill, ravenous fury, as if the demon had emerged by a series of underground steps to the open air. It was neither human nor bestial. It was wholly preternatural, hellish, macabre. And I shuddered with an insupportable eeriness that still persisted when the demon voice, after reaching its culmination, had returned by reverse degrees to a profound, sepulchral silence. Sir John had given no apparent heed to the awful sound, but had gone on with no more than his usual faltering. He had reached the end of the hall and was pausing before the second chamber from the one with the sealed door. I'll let you have this room, he said. It's just beyond the one I occupy. He didn't turn his face toward me as he spoke, 
and his voice was unnaturally toneless and restrained. I realised with another shudder that the chamber he had indicated as his own was adjacent to the room from which the frightful ululation had appeared to issue. The chamber to which he now admitted me had manifestly not been used for years. The air was chill, stagnant, unwholesome, with an all-pervading mustiness. And the antique furniture had gathered the inevitable increment of dust and cobwebs. Sir John began to apologise. I didn't realise the condition of the room, he said. I'll send Harper after dinner to do a little dusting and clearing and, and put fresh linen on the bed. I protested rather vaguely that there was no need for him to apologise. The unhuman loneliness and decay of the old manor house, its lustrums and decades of neglect, and the corresponding desolation of its owner had impressed me more painfully than ever, and I dared not speculate over much concerning the ghastly secret of the barred chamber and the hellish howling that still echoed in my shaken nerves. Already I regretted the singular fortuity that had drawn me to that place of evil and festering shadows. I felt an urgent desire to leave, to continue my journey even in the face of bleak autumnal rain and wind-blown darkness, but I could think of no excuse that would be sufficiently tangible and valid. Manifestly, there was nothing to do but remain. Our dinner was served in a dismal but stately room by the old man whom Sir John had referred to as Harper. The meal was plain but substantial and well cooked, and the service was impeccable. I had begun to infer that Harper was the only servant, a combination of valet, butler, housekeeper and chef. In spite of my hunger and the pains taken by my host to make me feel at ease, the meal was a solemn and almost funereal ceremony. I couldn't forget my father's story, and still less could I forget the sealed door and the baleful ululation. Whatever it was, the monstrosity still lived, and I felt a complex mingling of admiration, pity and horror as I looked at the gaunt and gallant face of Sir John Tremoth and reflected upon the lifelong hell to which he had been condemned and the apparent fortitude with which he had borne its unthinkable ordeals. A bottle of excellent sherry was brought in. Over this we sat for an hour or more. Sir John spoke at some length concerning my father, of whose death he had not previously heard, and he drew me out in regard to my own affairs with the subtle adroitness of a polished man of the world. He said little about himself, and not even by hint or implication did he refer to the tragic history which I have outlined. Since I am rather abstemious, I did not empty my glass with much frequency, and the major part of the heavy wine was consumed by my host. Toward the end it seemed to bring out in him a curious vein of confidentiality, and he spoke for the first time of the ill health that was all too patent in his appearance. I learned that he was subject to that most painful form of heart disease, angina pectoris, and had recently recovered from an attack of unusual severity. The next one will finish me, he said, and it may come at any time, perhaps tonight. He made the announcement very simply, as if he were voicing a commonplace or venturing a prediction about the weather. Then, after a slight pause, he went on, with more emphasis and weightiness of tone. Maybe you'll think me queer, but I have a fixed prejudice against burial or vault interment. I want my remains to be thoroughly cremated and have left careful directions to that end. Harper will see to it that they are fulfilled. The fire is the cleanest and purest of the elements, and it cuts short all the damnable processes between death and ultimate disintegration. I can't bear the idea of some mouldy, worm-infested tomb. He continued to discourse on the subject for some time, with a singular elaboration and tenseness of manner that showed it to be a familiar theme of thought, if not an actual obsession. It seemed to possess a morbid fascination for him, and there was a painful light in his hollow, haunted eyes, and a touch of rigidly subdued hysteria in his voice as he spoke. I remembered the atonement of Lady Agatha and her tragic resurrection and the dim, delirious horror of the vaults that had formed an inexplicable and vaguely disturbing part of her story. It was not hard to understand Sir John's aversion to burial. 
but I was far from suspecting the full terror and ghastliness on which his repugnance had been founded. Harper had disappeared after bringing the sherry, and I surmised that he had been given orders for the renovation of my room. We had now drained our last glasses, and my host had ended his peroration. The wind, which had animated him briefly, seemed to die out, and he looked more ill and haggard than ever. Pleading my own fatigue, I expressed a wish to retire, and he, with his invariable courtliness, insisted on seeing me to my chamber and making sure of my comfort before seeking his own bed. In the hall above we met Harper, who was just descending from a flight of stairs that must have led to an attic or third floor. He was carrying a heavy iron pan in which a few scraps of meat remained, and I caught an odour of pronounced gaminess, almost virtual putrescence from the pan as he went by. I wondered if he had been feeding the unknown monstrosity, and if perhaps its food were supplied to it through a trap in the ceiling of the barred room. The surmise was reasonable enough, but the odour of the scraps by a train of remote, half-literary association had begun to suggest other surmises which, it would seem, were beyond the realms of possibility and reason. Certain evasive, incoherent hints appeared to point themselves suddenly to an atrocious and abhorrent whole. With imperfect success, I assured myself that the thing I had fancied was incredible to science was a mere creation of superstitious diabellerie. No, it could not be. Here, in England of all places, that corpse-devouring demon of oriental tales and legend, the ghoul. Contrary to my fears, there was no repetition of the fiendish howling as we passed the secret room but I thought that I heard a measured crunching, such as a large animal would make in devouring its food. My room, though still drear and dismal enough, had been cleared of its accumulated dust and matted gossamers. After a personal inspection, Sir John left me and retired to his own chamber. I was struck by his deathly pallor and weakness as he said goodnight to me and felt guiltily apprehensive that the strain of receiving and entertaining a guest might have aggravated the dire disease from which he suffered. I seemed to detect actual pain and torment beneath his careful armour of urbanity, and wondered if the urbanity had not been maintained at an excessive cost. The fatigue of my day-long journey, together with the heavy wine I had drunk, should have conduced to early slumber, but though I lay with tightly closed lids in the darkness, I could not dismiss those evil shadows, those black and charnel larvae that swarmed upon me from the ancient house. Insufferable and forbidden things besieged me with filthy talons, brushed me with noisome coils, and I tossed through eternal hours and lay staring at the grey square of the storm-darkened window. The dripping of the rain, the sough and moan of the wind resolved themselves to a dread mutter of half-articulate voices that plotted against my peace and whispered loathfully of nameless secrets in demonian language. At length, after the seeming lapse of nocturnal centuries, the tempest died away, and I no longer heard the equivocal voices. The window lightened a little in the black wall, and the terrors of my night-long insomnia seemed to withdraw partially, but without bringing the surcease of slumber. I became aware of utter silence, and then, in the silence, of a queer, faint, disquieting sound whose cause and location baffled me for many minutes. The sound was muffled and far away at times. Then. It seemed to draw near, as if it were in the next room. I began to identify it as a sort of scratching, such as would be made by the claws of an animal on solid woodwork. Sitting up in bed and listening attentively, I realised with a fresh start of horror that it came from the direction of the barred chamber. It took on a strange resonance. Then it became almost inaudible, and, and suddenly for a while it ceased. 
In the interim, I heard a strange groan, like that of a man in great agony or terror. I couldn't mistake the source of the groan which had issued from Sir John Tremoth's room, nor was I doubtful any longer as to the causation of the scratching. The groan was not repeated, but the damnable clawing sound began again, and was continued till daybreak. Then, as if the creature that had caused the noise were wholly nocturnal in its habits, the faint, vibrant rasping ceased and was not resumed. In a state of dull, nightmarish apprehension, drugged with weariness and want of sleep, I had listened to it with intolerably straining ears. With its cessation, in the hueless, livid dawn, I slid into a deep slumber, from which the muffled and amorphous spectres of the old hall were unable to detain me any longer. I was awakened by a loud knocking on my door, a knocking in which even my sleep-confused senses could recognise the imperative and urgent. It must have been close on midday, and feeling guilty at having overslept so egregiously, I ran to the door and opened it. The old manservant, Harper, was standing without, and his tremulous, grief-broken manner told me before he spoke that something of dire import had occurred. I regret to tell you, Mr. Chaldane, he quavered, that, that Sir John is dead. He, he did not answer my knock, as usual, so I made bold to enter his room. He, he must have died early this morning. Inexpressibly shocked by his announcement, I recalled the single groan I had heard in the grey beginning of dawn. My host, perhaps, had been dying at that very moment. I recalled, too, the detestable nightmare scratching. Unavoidably, I wondered if the groan had been occasioned by fear as well as by physical pain. Had the strain and suspense of listening to that hideous sound brought on the final paroxysm of Sir John's malady? I couldn't be sure of the truth, but my brain seethed with awful and ghastly conjectures. With the futile formalities that one employs on such occasions, I tried to console with the aged servant, and offered him such assistance as I could in making the necessary arrangements for the disposition of his master's remains. Since there was no telephone in the house, I volunteered to find a doctor who would examine the body and sign the death certificate. The old man seemed to find a singular relief and gratitude. Thank you, sir, he said fervently, then, as if in explanation, I, I don't want to leave, Sir John. I, I promised him I I'd keep a close watch over his body. He went on to speak of Sir John's desire for cremation. It seemed that the baronet had left explicit directions for the building of a pyre of driftwood on the hill behind the hall, the burning of his remains on this pyre, and the sowing of his ashes on the fields of the estate. These directions he had enjoined and empowered the servant to carry out as soon after death as possible. No one was to be present at the ceremony except Harper and the hired pallbearers, and Sir John's nearer relatives, none of whom lived in the vicinity, were not to be informed of his demise till all was over. I refused Harper's offer to prepare my breakfast, telling him that I could obtain a meal in the neighbouring village. There was a strange uneasiness in his manner and I realised, with thoughts and emotions not to be specified in this narrative, that he was anxious to begin his promised vigil beside Sir John's corpse. It would be tedious and unnecessary to detail the funereal afternoon that followed. The heavy sea fog had returned, and I seemed to grope my way through a sodden but unreal world as I sought the nearby town. I succeeded in locating a doctor, and also in securing several men to build the pyre and act as pallbearers. I was met everywhere with an odd taciturnity, and no one seemed willing to comment on Sir John's death or to speak of the dark legendary that was attached to Tremoth Hall. Harper, to my amazement, had proposed that the cremation should take place at once. This, however, proved to be impracticable. When all the formalities and arrangements had been completed, the fog turned into a steady, everlasting downpour which rendered impossible the lighting of the pyre, and we were compelled to defer the ceremony. I had proposed to Harper that I should remain at the hall till all was done, and so it was that I spent a second night beneath that roof of accursed and abominable secrets. The darkness came on betimes. After a last visit to the village in which I procured some sandwiches for Harper and myself in view of dinner, I returned to the lonely hall. I was met by Harper on the stairs as I ascended to the death chamber. 
there was an increased agitation in his manner as if something had happened to frighten him. I, I wonder if you'll keep me company tonight, Mr. Chaldane, he said. It's a gruesome watch that I'm asking you to share, and it may be a dangerous one. But Sir John would thank you, I'm sure. If you have a weapon of any sort, it would be well to bring it with you. It was impossible to refuse his request, and I assented at once. I was unarmed, so Harper insisted on equipping me with an antique revolver, of which he himself carried the mate. Look here, Harper, I said bluntly as we followed the hall to Sir John's chamber. What are you afraid of? He flinched visibly at the question and seemed unwilling to answer. Then, after a moment, he appeared to realise that frankness was necessary. It's the thing in the barred room, he explained. You must have heard it, sir. We've had the care of it, Sir John and I, these eight and twenty years, and we've always feared that it might break out. It never gave us much trouble as long as we kept it well fed, but for the last three nights it has been scratching at that thick oaken wall of Sir John's chamber, which is something it never did before. Sir John thought it knew that he was going to die and that it wanted to reach his body. Being hungry for other food than we had given it, that's why we must guard him closely tonight, Mr. Chaldane. I pray to God that the wall will hold, but the thing keeps on clawing and clawing like, like a demon, and I don't like the hollowness of the sound, as if the wall were getting pretty thin. Appalled by this confirmation of my own most repugnant surmise, I could offer no rejoinder, since all comment would have been futile. With Harper's open avowal, the abnormality took on a darker and a more encroaching shadow, a more potent and tyrannic menace. Willingly would I have foregone the promised vigil, but this, of course, it was impossible to do. The bestial, diabolic scratching, louder and more frantic than before, assailed my ears before we passed the barred room. All too readily I understood the nameless fear that had impelled the old man to request my company. The sound was inexpressibly alarming and nerve-sapping with its grim, macabre insistence, its intimation of ghoulish hunger. It became even plainer with a hideous, tearing vibrancy when we entered the room of death. During the whole course of that funereal day, I had refrained from visiting this chamber, since I am lacking in the morbid curiosity which impels many to gaze upon the dead. So it was that I beheld my host for the second and last time. Fully dressed and prepared for the pie, he lay on the chill white bed whose heavily figured, arras-like curtains had been drawn back. The room was lit by several tall tapers arranged on a little table in curious brazen candelabras that were greened with antiquity, but the light seemed to afford only a doubtful, dolorous glimmering in the drear spaciousness and mortuary shadows. Somewhat against my will, I gazed on the dead features and averted my eyes very hastily. I was prepared for the stony pallor and rigour, but not for the full betrayal of that hideous revulsion, that inhuman terror and horror which must have corroded the man's heart through infernal years, and which, with almost superhuman control, he had masked from the casual beholder in life. The revelation was too painful, and I could not look at him again. In a sense, it seemed that he was not dead that he was still listening with agonised attention to the dreadful sounds that might well have served to precipitate the final attack of his malady. There were several chairs dating, I think, like the bed itself from the 17th century. Harper and I seated ourselves near the small table and between the deathbed and the panelled wall of blackish wood from which the ceaseless clawing sound appeared to issue. In tacit silence, with drawn and cocked revolvers, we began our ghastly vigil. As we sat and waited, I was driven to picture the unnamed monstrosity and formless or half-formed images of charnel nightmare pursued each other in chaotic succession through my mind. An atrocious curiosity to which I should normally have been a stranger prompted me to question Harper but I was restrained by an even more powerful inhibition. 
On his part, the old man volunteered no information or comment whatever, but watched the wall with fear-bright eyes that did not seem to waver in his palsy-nodding head. It would be impossible to convey the unnatural tension, the macabre suspense and baleful expectation of the hours that followed. The woodwork must have been of great thickness and hardness, such as would have defied the assaults of any normal creature equipped only with talons or teeth. But in spite of such obvious arguments as these, I thought momentarily to see it crumble inward. The scratching noise went on eternally, and to my febrile fancy it grew sharper and nearer every instant. At recurrent intervals I seemed to hear a low, eager, dog-like whining, such as a ravenous animal would make when it neared the goal of its burrowing. Neither of us had spoken of what we should do, in case the monster should attain its objective, but there seemed to be an unvoiced agreement. However, with a superstitiousness of which I should not have believed myself capable, I began to wonder if the monster possessed enough of humanity in its composition to be vulnerable to mere revolver bullets. To what extent would it display the traits of its unknown and fabulous paternity? I tried to convince myself that such questions and wonderings were patently absurd, but was drawn to them again and again, as if by the allurement of some forbidden gulf. The night wore on like the flowing of a dark, sluggish stream, and the tall funeral tapers had burned to within an inch of their verdigree-eaten sockets. It was this circumstance alone that gave me an idea of the passage of time, for I seemed to be drowning in a black eternity, motionless beneath the clawing and seething of blind horrors. I had grown so accustomed to the clawing noise in the woodwork, and the sound had gone on so long, that I deemed its ever-growing sharpness and hollowness a mere hallucination, and so it was that the end of our vigil came, without apparent warning. Suddenly, as I stared at the wall and listened with frozen fixity, I heard a harsh splintering sound, and saw that a narrow strip had broken loose and was hanging from the panel. Then, before I could collect myself or credit the awful witness of my senses, a large semicircular portion of the wall collapsed in many splinters beneath the impact of some ponderous body. Mercifully, perhaps, I have never been able to recall with any degree of distinctness the hellish thing that issued from the panel. The visual shock by its own excess of horror has almost blotted the details from my memory. I have, however, the blurred impression of a huge, whitish, hairless and semi-quadruped body, of canine teeth in a half-human face and long hyena nails at the end of forelimbs that were both arms and legs. A charnel stench preceded the apparition like a breath from the den of some carrion-eating animal. And then, with a single nightmare leap, the thing was upon us. I heard the staccato crack of Harper's revolver, sharp and vengeful in the closed room. But there was only a rusty click from my own weapon. Perhaps the cartridge was too old. At any rate, it had misfired. Before I could press the trigger again, I was hurled to the floor with terrific violence, striking my head against the heavy base of the little table. A black curtain, spangled with countless fires, appeared to fall upon me and to blot the room from sight. Then all the fires went out, and there was only darkness. Again, slowly, I became conscious of flame and shadow, but the flame was bright and flickering, and seemed to grow ever more brilliant. Then my dull, doubtful senses were sharply revived and clarified by the acrid odour of burning cloth. The features of the room returned to vision, and I found that I was lying huddled against the overthrown table, gazing toward the deathbed. The guttering candles had been hurled to the floor. One of them was eating a slow circle of fire in the carpet beside me, and another, spreading, had ignited the bed curtains, which were flaring swiftly upward to the great canopy. Even as I lay staring, 
Huge, ruddy tatters of the burning fabric fell upon the bed in a dozen places, and the body of Sir John Tremoth was ringed about with starting flames. I staggered heavily to my feet, dazed and giddy with the fall that had hurled me into oblivion. The room was empty except for the old manservant, who lay near the door moaning indistinctly. The door itself stood open as if someone, or something, had gone out during my period of unconsciousness. I turned again to the bed with some instinctive, half-formed intention of trying to extinguish the blaze. The flames were spreading rapidly, were leaping higher, but they were not swift enough to veil from my sickened eyes the hands and features, if one could any longer call them such, of that which had been Sir John Tremoth. Of the last horror that had overtaken him, I must forbear explicit mention, and I would that I could likewise avoid the remembrance. All too tardily had the monster been frightened away by the fire. There is little more to tell. Looking back once more, as I reeled from the smoke-laden room with Harper in my arms, I saw that the bed and its canopy had become a mass of mounting flames. The unhappy baronet had found in his own death chamber the funeral pyre for which he had longed. It was nearly dawn when we emerged from the doomed manor house. The rain had ceased, leaving a heaven lined with high and dead grey clouds. The chill air appeared to revive the aged manservant, and he stood feebly beside me, uttering not a word as we watched an ever-climbing spire of flame that broke from the sombre roof of Tremoth Hall and began to cast a sullen glare on the unkempt edges. In the combined light of the fireless dawn and the lurid conflagration, we both saw at our feet the semi-human, monstrous footprints, with their mark of long and canine nails that had been trodden freshly and deeply into the rain-wet soil. They came from the direction of the manor house and ran toward the heath-clad hill that rose behind it. Still without speaking, we followed the steps. Almost without interruption they led to the entrance of the ancient family vaults, to the heavy iron door in the hillside that had been closed for a full generation by Sir John Tremoth's order. The door itself swung open, and we saw that its rusty chain and lock had been shattered by a strength that was more than the strength of man or beast. Then, peering within, we saw the clay-touched outline of the unreturning footprints that went downward into mausolean darkness on the stairs. We were both weaponless, having left our revolvers behind us in the death chamber, but we did not hesitate long. Harper possessed a liberal supply of matches, and looking about I found a heavy billet of water-soaked wood which might serve in lieu of a cudgel. In grim silence, with tacit determination and forgetful of any danger, we conducted a thorough search of the well-nigh interminable vaults, striking match after match as we went on into the musty shadows. The traces of ghoulish footsteps grew fainter as we followed them into these black recesses, and we found nothing anywhere but noisome dampness and undisturbed cobwebs and the countless coffins of the dead. The thing that we sought had vanished utterly, as if swallowed up by the subterranean walls. At last we returned to the entrance. There, as we stood blinking in the full daylight with grey and haggard faces, Harper spoke for the first time, saying in his slow, tremulous voice, Many years ago, Soon after Lady Agatha's death, Sir John and I searched the vaults from end to end, but we could find no trace of the thing we suspected. Now, as then, it is useless to seek. There are mysteries which, God helping, will never be fathomed. We know only that the offspring of the vaults has gone back to the vaults. There may it remain. Silently, in my shaken heart, I echoed his last words and his wish. The New Catacomb 
by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Look here, Berger, said Kennedy. I do wish that you'd confide in me. The two famous students of Roman remains sat together in Kennedy's comfortable room overlooking the Corso. The night was cold, and they had both pulled up their chairs to the unsatisfactory Italian stove, which threw out a zone of stuffiness rather than of warmth. Outside, under the bright winter stars, lay the modern Rome, the long double chain of the electric lamps, the brilliantly lighted cafes, the rushing carriages and the dense throng upon the footpaths. But inside, in the sumptuous chamber of the rich young English archaeologist, there was only old Rome to be seen. Cracked and time-worn friezes hung upon the walls, grey old busts of senators and soldiers with their fighting heads and their hard, cruel faces peered out from the corners. On the centre-table, amidst a litter of inscriptions, fragments and ornaments, there stood the famous reconstruction by Kennedy of the Baths of Caracalla, which excited such interest and admiration when it was exhibited in Berlin. Amphorae hung from the ceiling, and a litter of curiosities strewed the rich red turkey carpet. And of them all, there was not one which was not of the most unimpeachable authenticity, and of the utmost rarity and value. For Kennedy, though little more than thirty, had a European reputation in this particular branch of research, and was, moreover, provided with that long purse which either proves to be a fatal handicap to the student's energies, or, if his mind is still true to its purpose, gives him an enormous advantage in the race for fame. Kennedy had often been seduced by whim and pleasure from his studies, but his mind was an incisive one, capable of long and concentrated efforts which ended in sharp reactions of sensuous languor. His handsome face, with its high white forehead, its aggressive nose, and its somewhat loose and sensual mouth, was a fair index of the compromise between strength and weakness in his nature. Of a very different type was his companion, Julius Berger. He came of a curious blend, a German father and an Italian mother, with the robust qualities of the North mingling strangely with the softer graces of the South. Blue Teutonic eyes lightened his sun-browned face, and above them rose a square, massive forehead with a fringe of close yellow curls lying round it. His strong, firm jaw was clean-shaven, and his companion had frequently remarked how much it suggested those old Roman busts which peered out from the shadows in the corners of his chamber. Under its bluff German strength, there lay always a suggestion of Italian subtlety, but the smile was so honest and the eyes so frank that one understood that this was only an indication of his ancestry, with no actual bearing upon his character. In age and in reputation he was on the same level as his English companion, but his life and his work had both been far more arduous. Twelve years before he had come as a poor student to Rome, and had lived ever since upon some small endowment for research which had been awarded to him by the University of Bonn. Painfully, slowly, and doggedly, with extraordinary tenacity and single-mindedness, he had climbed from rung to rung of the ladder of fame, until now he was a member of the Berlin Academy, and there was every reason to believe that he would shortly be promoted to the chair of the greatest of German universities. But the singleness of purpose which had brought him to the same high level as the rich and brilliant Englishman had caused him in everything outside their work to stand infinitely below him. He had never found a pause in his studies in which to cultivate the social graces. It was only when he spoke of his own subject that his face was filled with life and soul. At other times he was silent and embarrassed, too conscious of his own limitations in larger subjects and impatient of that small talk which is the conventional refuge of those who have no thoughts to express. And yet, for some years, there had been an acquaintanceship which appeared to be slowly ripening into a friendship between these two very different rivals. The base and origin of this lay in the fact that in their own studies, 
Each was the only one of the younger men who had knowledge and enthusiasm enough to properly appreciate the other. Their common interests and pursuits had brought them together, and each had been attracted by the other's knowledge. And then, gradually, something had been added to this. Kennedy had been amused by the frankness and simplicity of his rival, while Berger in turn had been fascinated by the brilliancy and vivacity which had made Kennedy such a favourite in Roman society. I say had, because just at the moment the young Englishman was somewhat under a cloud. A love affair, the details of which had never quite come out, had indicated a heartlessness and callousness upon his part, which shocked many of his friends. But in the bachelor circles of students and artists in which he preferred to move, there is no very rigid code of honour in such matters. And though a head might be shaken, or a pair of shoulders shrugged over the flight of two and the return of one, the general sentiment was probably one of curiosity, and perhaps of envy, rather than of reprobation. Look here, Berger, said Kennedy, looking hard at the placid face of his companion, I do wish that you would confide in me. As he spoke, he waved his hand in the direction of a rug which lay upon the floor. On the rug stood a long, shallow fruit basket of the light wicker work which is used in the Campagna, and this was heaped with a litter of objects, inscribed tiles, broken inscriptions, cracked mosaics, torn papyri, rusty metal ornaments, which to the uninitiated might have seemed to have come straight from a dustman's bin, but which a specialist would have speedily recognised as unique of their kind. The pile of odds and ends in the flat wickerwork basket supplied exactly one of those missing links of social development which are of such interest to the student. It was the German who had brought them in, and the Englishman's eyes were hungry as he looked at them. I won't interfere with your treasure trove, but I should very much like to hear about it, he continued, while Berger very deliberately lit a cigar. It is evidently a discovery of the first importance. These inscriptions will make a sensation throughout Europe. For every one here there are a million there, said the German. There are so many that a dozen savants might spend a lifetime over them and build up a reputation as solid as the castle of St. Angelo. Kennedy sat thinking, with his fine forehead wrinkled, his fingers playing with his long, fair moustache. You've given yourself away, Berger, said he at last. Your words can apply only to one thing. You've discovered a new catacomb. I had no doubt that you had already come to that conclusion from an examination of these objects. Well, they certainly appeared to indicate it, but your last remarks make it certain there is no place except a catacomb which could contain so vast a store of relics as you describe. Quite so. There is no mystery about that. I have discovered a new catacomb. Where? Ah! That is my secret, my dear Kennedy. Suffice it that it is so situated that there is not one chance in a million of anyone else coming upon it. Its date is different from that of any known catacomb, and it has been reserved for the burial of the highest Christians, so that the remains and the relics are quite different from anything which has ever been seen before. If I was not aware of your knowledge and of your energy, my friend, I would not hesitate, under the pledge of secrecy, to tell you everything about it. But, as it is, I think that I must certainly prepare my own report of the matter before I expose myself to such formidable competition. Kennedy loved his subject with a love which was almost a mania, a love which held him true to it amidst all the distractions which come to a wealthy and dissipated young man. He had ambition but his ambition was secondary to his mere abstract joy and interest in everything which concerned the old life and history of the city. He yearned to see this new underworld which his companion had discovered. Look here, Berger, he said earnestly, I assure you that you can trust me most implicitly in the matter. Nothing would induce me to put pen to paper about anything which I see until I have your express permission. I quite understand your feeling and think it's most natural, but you have really nothing whatever to fear from me. 
On the other hand, if you don't tell me, I shall make a systematic search, and I shall most certainly discover it. In that case, of course, I should make what use I liked of it, since I would be under no obligation to you. Berger smiled thoughtfully over his cigar. I have noticed, friend Kennedy, said he, that when I want information of any point, you are not always so ready to supply it. When did you ever ask me anything that I didn't tell you? You remember, for example, my giving you the material for your paper about the Temple of the Vestals? Ah, well, that was not a matter of much importance. If I were to question you upon some intimate thing, would you give me an answer, I wonder? This new catacomb is a very intimate thing to me, and I should certainly expect some sign of confidence in return. What you're driving at, I can't imagine, said the Englishman. But if you mean that you will answer my questions about the catacomb if I answer any question which you may put to me, I can assure you that I will certainly do so. Well then, said Berger, leaning luxuriously back in his settee and puffing a blue tree of cigar smoke into the air, tell me all about your relations with Miss Mary Saunderson. Kennedy sprang up in his chair and glared angrily at his impassive companion. What the devil do you mean, he cried. What sort of a question is this? You may mean it as a joke, but you never made a worse one. No, I don't mean it as a joke, said Berger simply. I am really rather interested in the details of the matter. I don't know much about the world and women and social life and that sort of thing, and such an incident has the fascination of the unknown for me. I know you, and I know her by sight. I had even spoken to her once or twice. I should very much like to hear from your own lips exactly what it was which occurred between you. I won't tell you a word. That's all right. It was only my whim to see if you would give up a secret as easily as you expected me to give up the secret of the new catacomb. You wouldn't, and I didn't expect you to. But why should you expect otherwise of me? There's St. John's clock striking ten. It's quite time that I was going home. No, wait a bit, Berger, said Kennedy. This is really a ridiculous caprice of yours to wish to know about an old love affair, which has burned out months ago. You know, we look upon a man who kisses and tells as the greatest card and villain possible. Certainly, said the German, gathering up his basket of curiosities. When he tells anything about a girl which is previously unknown, he must be so. But in this case, as you must be aware, it was a public matter which was the common talk of Rome, so that you are not really doing Miss Mary Saunderson any injury by discussing her case with me. But still, I respect your scruples, and so, good night. Wait a bit, Berger, said Kennedy, laying his hand upon the other's arm. I'm very keen upon this catacomb business, and I can't let it drop quite so easily. Would you mind asking me something else in return, something not quite so eccentric this time? No, no, you have refused, and there is an end of it, said Berger, with his basket on his arm. No doubt you are quite right not to answer, and no doubt I am quite right also, and so again, my dear Kennedy. Good night. The Englishman watched Berger cross the room, and he had his hand on the handle of the door before his host sprang up with the air of a man who is making the best of that which cannot be helped. Hold on, old fellow, said he. I think you're behaving in a most ridiculous fashion, but still, if this is your condition, I suppose that I must submit to it. I hate saying anything about a girl, but as you say, it's all over, Rome, and I don't suppose I can tell you anything which you do not know already. What was it you wanted to know? The German came back to the stove, and laying down his basket, he sank into his chair once more. "'May I have another cigar?' said he. "'Thank you very much. I never smoke when I work, but I enjoy a chat much more when I am under the influence of tobacco. Now, um, as regards this young lady with whom you had this uh, little adventure, what in the world has become of her?' "'She's at home uh, with her own people.' "'Oh, really? In England?' "'Yes.' "'What part of England?' London? No, uh, Twickenham. You must excuse my curiosity, my dear Kennedy, and you must put it down to my ignorance of the world. No doubt it is quite a simple thing to persuade a young lady to go off with you for three weeks or so, and then to hand her over to her own family at, uh, what did you call the place? Twickenham. 
quite so at Twickenham, but it is something so entirely outside my own experience that I cannot even imagine how you set about it. For example, if you had loved this girl, your love could hardly disappear in three weeks, so I presume that you could not have loved her at all. But if you did not love her, why should you make this great scandal, which has damaged you and ruined her? Kennedy looked moodily into the red eye of the stove. That's a logical way of looking at it, certainly, said he. Love is a big word, and it represents a good many different shades of feeling. I liked her, and, well, you say you've seen her. You know how charming she could look. But still, uh, I'm willing to admit, uh, looking back, that I could never have really loved her. Then, my dear Kennedy, why did you do it? The adventure of the thing had a great deal to do with it. What? You are so fond of adventures. Where would the variety of life be without them? It was for an adventure that I first began to pay my attentions to her. I have chased a good deal of game in my time, but there's no chase like that of a pretty woman. There was a piquant difficulty of it also, for as she was the companion of Lady Emily Rood, it was almost impossible to see her alone. On top of all the other obstacles which attracted me, I learned from her own lips very early in the proceedings that she was engaged. My God! To whom? Ah, she mentioned no names. I do not think that anyone knows that. So that made the adventure more alluring, did it? Well, it did certainly give a spice to it. Don't you think so? I tell you that I am very ignorant about these things. My dear fellow, you can remember that the apple you stole from your neighbour's tree was always sweeter than that which fell from your own. And then I found that she cared for me. What? At once? Oh, no, it took about three months of sapping and mining. But at last I won her over. She understood that my judicial separation from my wife made it impossible for me to do the right thing by her, but she came all the same. And we had a delightful time, as long as it lasted. But how about the other man? Kennedy shrugged his shoulders. I suppose it's the survival of the fittest, said he. If he had been the better man, she wouldn't have deserted him. Let's drop the subject, for I've had enough of it. Only one other thing. How did you get rid of her in three weeks? Well, we both cooled down a bit, you understand. She absolutely refused, under any circumstances, to come back to face the people she'd known in Rome. Now, of course, Rome is necessary to me, and I was already pining to be back at my work. So there was one obvious cause of separation. Then again, her old father turned up at the hotel in London, and there was a scene, and the, the whole thing became so unpleasant that really, though I missed her dreadfully at first, I was very glad to slip out of it. Now, I rely upon you not to repeat anything of what I've said. My dear Kennedy, I should not dream of repeating it, but all that you say interests me very much, for it gives me an insight into your way of looking at things, which is entirely different from mine, for I have seen so little of life. And now you want to know about my new catacomb. There's no use my trying to describe it, for you would never find it by that. There is only one thing, and that is for me to take you there. That would be splendid. When would you like to come? The sooner the better. I'm all impatience to see it. Well, it is a beautiful night, though a trifle cold. Suppose we start in an hour. We must be very careful to keep the matter to ourselves. If anyone saw us hunting in couples, they would suspect that there was something going on. Ah, oh, we can't be too cautious, said Kennedy. Is it far? Some miles? Not too far to walk? Oh, no, we could walk there easily. We had better do so, then. A cabman's suspicions would be aroused if he dropped us both at some lonely spot in the dead of the night. Quite so. I think it would be best for us to meet at the gate of the Appian Way at midnight. I must go back to my lodgings for the matches and candles and things. All right, Berger. I think it's very kind of you to let me into this secret, and I promise you that I'll write nothing about it until you've published your report. Goodbye for the present. You will find me at the gate at twelve.
The cold, clear air was filled with the musical chimes from that city of clocks, as Berger, wrapped in an Italian overcoat, with a lantern hanging from his hand, walked up to the rendezvous. Kennedy stepped out of the shadow to meet him. "'You are ardent in work as well as in love,' said the German, laughing. "'Yes, I've been waiting here for nearly half an hour. I hope you have left no clue as to where we are going. Not such a fool. By Jove, I'm chilled to the bone. Come on, Berger, let's warm ourselves by a spurt of hard walking.' Their footsteps sounded loud and crisp upon the rough stone paving of the disappointing road, which is all that is left of the most famous highway of the world. A peasant or two going home from the wine shop, and a few carts of country produce coming up to Rome, were the only things which they met. They swung along with the huge tombs looming up through the darkness upon each side of them, until they had come as far as the catacombs of St. Callistus, and saw, against a rising moon, the great circular bastion of Cecilia Metella in front of them. Then Berger stopped with his hand to his side. Your legs are longer than mine, and you are more accustomed to walking, said he, laughing. I think that the place where we turn off is somewhere here. Yes, uh, this is it, around the corner of the Trattoria. Now, it is a very narrow path, so perhaps I had better go in front and you can follow. He had lit his lantern and by its light they were enabled to follow a narrow and devious track which wound across the marshes of the Campania. The great aqueduct of old Rome lay like a monstrous caterpillar across the moonlit landscape, and their road led them under one of its huge arches and past the circle of crumbling bricks which marks the old arena. At last Berger stopped at a solitary wooden cowhouse and drew a key from his pocket. "'Surely your catacomb is not inside a house,' cried Kennedy. "'The entrance to it is, that is just a safeguard which we have against anyone else discovering it. "'Does the proprietor know of it? Not he. "'He had found one or two objects which made me almost certain that his house was built on the entrance to such a place. "'So I rented it from him and did my excavations for myself. "'Come in and shut the door behind you.' It was a long, empty building, with the mangers of the cows along one wall. Berger put his lantern down on the ground, and shaded its light in all directions save one by draping his overcoat round it. It might excite remark if anyone saw a light in this lonely place, said he. Just help me to move this boarding. The flooring was loose in the corner, and plank by plank the two savants raised it and leaned it against the wall. Below there was a square aperture and a stair of old stone steps which led away down into the bowels of the earth. Be careful, cried Berger, as Kennedy in his impatience hurried down there. It's a perfect rabbit's warren below, and if you were once to lose your way there, the chances would be a hundred to one against your ever coming out again. Wait until I bring the light. How do you find your own way if it's so complicated? I had some very narrow escapes at first, but I have gradually learned to go about. There is a certain system to it, but it is one which a lost man, if he were in the dark, could not possibly find out. Even now I always spin out a ball of string behind me when I am going far into the catacomb. You can see for yourself that it's difficult, but every one of the passages divides and subdivides a dozen times before you go a hundred yards. They had descended some twenty feet from the level of the byre, and they were standing now in a square chamber cut out of the soft tufa. The lantern cast a flickering light, bright below and dim above, over the cracked brown walls. In every direction were the black openings of passages which radiated from this common centre. "'I want you to follow me closely, my friend,' said Berger. "'Do not loiter to look at anything upon the way.' for the place to which I will take you contains all that you can see and more. I will save time for us to go there, direct. He led the way down one of the corridors, and the Englishman followed closely at his heels. Every now and then the passage bifurcated, but Berger was evidently following some secret marks of his own, for he neither stopped nor hesitated. 
Everywhere along the walls, packed like the berths upon an emigrant ship, lay the Christians of old Rome. The yellow light flickered over the shriveled features of the mummies and gleamed upon rounded skulls and long white arm bones crossed over fleshless chests. And everywhere as he passed, Kennedy looked with wistful eyes upon inscriptions, funeral vessels, pictures, vestments, utensils, all lying as pious hands had placed them so many centuries ago. It was apparent to him, even in those hurried passing glances, that this was the earliest and finest of the catacombs, containing such a storehouse of Roman remains as had never before come at one time under the observation of the student. What would happen if the light went out, he asked, as they hurried onwards. I have a spare candle and box of matches in my pocket. Uh, By the way, Kennedy, have you any matches? No, uh, you'd better give me some. Ah, that is all right. There is no chance of our separating. How far are we going? It seems to me that we've walked at least a quarter of a mile. More than that, I think. There is really no limit to the tombs, at least. I have never been able to find any. This is a very difficult place, so I think that I will use our ball of string. He fastened one end of it to a projecting stone, and he carried the coil in the breast of his coat, paying it out as he advanced. Kennedy saw that it was no unnecessary precaution, for the passages had become more complex and tortuous than ever, with a perfect network of intersecting corridors. But these all ended in one large circular hall, with a square pedestal of tufa topped with a slab of marble at one end of it. "'By Jove!' cried Kennedy in an ecstasy, as Berger swung his lantern over the marble. "'It's a Christian altar, probably the first one in existence.' Here is the little consecration cross cut upon the corner of it. No doubt this circular space was used as a church. Precisely, said Berger, if I had more time I should like to show you all the bodies which are buried in these niches upon the walls, for they are the early popes and bishops of the church, with their mitres, their croziers and full canonicals. Go over to that one and look at it. Kennedy went across and stared at the ghastly head which lay loosely on the shredded and mouldering mitre. This is most interesting, said he, and his voice seemed to boom against the concave vault. As far as my experience goes, it is unique. Bring the lantern over, Berger, for I want to see them all. But the German had strolled away and was standing in the middle of the yellow circle of light at the other side of the hall. Do you know how many wrong turnings there are between this and the stairs? he asked. There are over two thousand. No doubt it was one of the means of protection which the Christians adopted. The odds are two thousand to one against a man getting out, even if he had a light. But if he were in the dark, it would, uh, of course, be far more difficult. So I should think. And the darkness is something dreadful. I tried it once for an experiment. Let us try again. He stooped to the lantern, and in an instant... It was as if an invisible hand was squeezed tightly over each of Kennedy's eyes. Never had he known what such darkness was. It seemed to press upon him and to smother him. It was a solid obstacle against which the body shrank from advancing. He put his hands out to push it back from him. "'They'll do, Berger,' said he. "'Let's have the light again.' But his companion began to laugh, and in that circular room... The sound seemed to come from every side at once. "'You seem uneasy, friend Kennedy,' said he. "'Go on, man, light the candle,' said Kennedy impatiently. "'It's very strange, Kennedy, but I could not in the least tell by the sound in which direction you stand. Could you tell where I am? No, you seem to be on every side of me. If it were not for this string which I hold in my hand, I should not have a notion which way to go.' I dare say so. Strike a light, man, and have an end of this nonsense. Well, Kennedy, there are two things which I understand that you are very fond of. The one is an adventure, and the other is an obstacle to surmount. The adventure must be the finding of your way out of this catacomb. The obstacle will be the darkness and the two thousand wrong turns, which make the way a little difficult to find. But you need not hurry, for you have plenty of time, and when you halt for a rest now and then, 
I should like you just to think of Miss Mary Saunderson and whether you treated her quite fairly. You devil, what do you mean, roared Kennedy. He was running about in little circles and clasping at the solid blackness with both hands. Goodbye, said the mocking voice, and it was already at some distance. I really do not think, Kennedy, even by your own showing, that you did the right thing by that girl. There was only one little thing which you appeared not to know, and I can supply it. Miss Saunderson was engaged to a poor, ungainly devil of a student, and his name was Julius Burger. There was a rustle somewhere, the vague sound of a foot striking a stone, and then there fell silence upon that old Christian church, a stagnant, heavy silence, which closed round Kennedy and shut him in like water round a drowning man. Some two months afterwards, the following paragraph made the round of the European press. One of the most interesting discoveries of recent years is that of the new catacomb in Rome, which lies some distance to the east of the well-known vaults of St. Calixtus. The finding of this important burial place, which is exceeding rich in most interesting early Christian remains, is due to the energy and sagacity of Dr. Julius Burger, the young German specialist, who is rapidly taking the first place as an authority upon ancient Rome. Although the first to publish his discourse, it appears that a less fortunate adventurer had anticipated Dr. Berger. Some months ago, Mr. Kennedy, the well-known English student, disappeared suddenly from his rooms in the Corso, and it was conjectured that his association with a recent scandal had driven him to leave Rome. It appears now that he had, in reality, fallen a victim to that fervid love of archaeology which had raised him to a distinguished place among living scholars. His body was discovered in the heart of the new catacomb, and it was evident from the condition of his feet and boots that he had tramped for days through the torturous corridors which make these subterranean tombs so dangerous to explorers. The deceased gentleman had, with inexplicable rashness, made his way into this labyrinth without, as far as can be discovered, taking with him either candles or matches, so that his sad fate was the natural result of his own temerity. What makes the matter more painful is that Dr. Julius Berger was an intimate friend of the deceased. His joy at the extraordinary find which he has been so fortunate as to make has been greatly marred by the terrible fate of his comrade. And fellow worker. The Horror at Chilton Castle by Joseph Payne Brennan I had decided to spend a leisurely summer in Europe, concentrating, if at all, on genealogical research. I went first to Ireland, journeying to Kilkenny, where I unearthed a mine of legend and authentic lore concerning my remote Irish ancestors, the O'Brinons, chief of Idoch in the ancient kingdom of Ossory. The Brennans, as the name was later spelled, lost their estates in the British confiscation under Thomas Wentworth, Earl of Strafford. The thieving Earl, I am happy to report, was subsequently beheaded in the tower. From Kilkenny I travelled to London, and then to Chesterfield in search of maternal ancestors, the Hobans, Wilkerson's, Seals, etc. Incomplete and fragmentary records left many great gaps, but my efforts were moderately successful, and at length I decided to go farther north and visit the vicinity of Chilton Castle, seat of Robert Chilton Payne, the twelfth Earl of Chilton. My relationship to the Chilton Paynes was a most distant one, and yet there existed a tenuous thread of past connection, and I thought it would amuse me to glimpse the castle. Arriving in Wexwold, the tiny village near the castle, late in the afternoon, I engaged a room at the Inn of the Red Goose, the only one there was, unpacked and went down for a simple meal consisting of a small loaf, cheese and ale. By the time I finished this stark and yet satisfying repast, darkness had set in, and with it came wind and rain. I resigned myself to an evening at the inn, 
There was ale enough, and I was in no hurry to go anywhere. After writing a few letters, I went down and ordered a pint of ale. The tap room was almost deserted. The bartender, a stout gentleman who seemed forever on the point of falling asleep, was pleasant but taciturn, and at length I fell to musing on the strange and frightening legend of Chilton Castle. There were variations of the legend, and without doubt the original tale had been embroidered down the centuries, but the essential outline of the story concerned a secret room somewhere in the castle. It was said that this room contained a terrifying spectacle which the Chilton Paines were obliged to keep hidden from the world. Only three persons were ever permitted to enter the room, the presiding Earl of Chilton, the Earl's male heir, and one other person designated by the Earl. Ordinarily this person was the factor of Chilton Castle. The room was entered only once in a generation. Within three days after the male heir came of age, he was conducted to the secret room by the Earl and the factor. The room was then sealed and never opened again until the heir conducted his own son to the grisly chamber. According to the legend, the heir was never the same person again after entering the room. Invariably, he would become sombre and withdrawn. His countenance would acquire a brooding, apprehensive expression which nothing could long dispel. One of the earlier earls of Chilton had gone completely mad and hurled himself from the turrets of the castle. Speculation about the contents of the secret room had continued for centuries. One version of the tale described the panic-stricken flight of the Gowers, with armed enemies hot on their flagging heels. Although there had been bad blood between the Chilton Paines and the Gowers, in their desperation the Gowers begged for refuge at Chilton Castle. The Earl gave them entry, conducted them to a hidden room, and left with the promise that they would be shielded from their pursuers. The Earl kept his promise. The Gower's enemies were turned away from the castle, their murderous plans unconsummated. The Earl, however, simply left the Gowers in a locked room to starve to death. The chamber was not opened until thirty years later, when the Earl's son finally broke the seal. A fearful sight met his eyes. The Gowers had starved to death slowly, and at last, judging by the appearance of the mingled skeletons, had turned to cannibalism. Another version of the legend indicated that the secret room had been used by medieval earls as a torture chamber. It was said that the ingenious instruments of pain were yet in the room, and that these lethal apparatuses still clutched the pitiful remains of their final victims, twisted fearfully in their last agonies. The third version mentioned one of the female ancestors of the Chilton Paines, Lady Susan Glanville, who had reputedly made a pact with the devil. She had been condemned as a witch, but had somehow managed to escape the stake. The date and even the manner of her death were unknown, but in some vague way the secret room was supposed to be connected with it. As I speculated on these different versions of the gruesome legend, the storm increased in intensity. Rain drummed steadily against the leaded windows of the inn, and now I could occasionally hear the distant mutter of thunder. Glancing at the rain-streaked panes, I shrugged and ordered another pint of ale. I had the fresh tankard halfway to my lips when the taproom door burst open, letting in a blast of wind and rain. The door was shut, and a tall figure, muffled to the ears in a dripping greatcoat, moved to the bar. Removing his cap, he ordered brandy. Having nothing better to do, I observed him closely. He looked about seventy, grizzled and weather-worn, but wiry, with an appearance of toughness and determination. He was frowning, as if absorbed in thinking through some unpleasant problem, yet his cold blue eyes inspected me keenly for a brief but deliberate interval. I could not place him in a tidy niche. He might be a local farmer, and yet I did not think he was. He had a vague air of authority, and though his clothes were certainly plain, they were, I thought, somewhat better in cut and quality than those of the local countrymen I had observed. A trivial incident opened a conversation between us. An unusually sharp crack of thunder made him turn towards the window. 
As he did so, he accidentally brushed his wet cap on the floor. I retrieved it for him. He thanked me, and then we exchanged commonplace remarks about the weather. I had an intuitive feeling that, although he was normally a reticent individual, he was presently wrestling with some severe problem which made him want to hear a human voice. Realising there was always the possibility that my intuition might, for once, have failed me, I nevertheless babbled on about my trip, about my genealogical researches in Kilkenny, London and Chesterfield, and finally about my distant relationship to the Chiltern Pains and my desire to get a good look at Chiltern Castle. Suddenly I found that he was gazing at me with an expression which, if not fierce, was disturbingly intense. An awkward silence ensued. I coughed, wondering uneasily what I had said to make those cold blue eyes stare at me so fixedly. At length he became aware of my growing embarrassment. You must uh, excuse me for staring, he apologised, but something you said, he hesitated. Could we perhaps take that table? He nodded towards a small table which sat half in shadow in the far corner of the room. I agreed, mystified but curious and we took our drinks to the secluded table. He sat frowning for a minute, as if uncertain how to begin. Finally, he introduced himself as William Coworth. I gave him my name, and still he hesitated. At length he took a swallow of brandy, and then looked straight at me. I am, he stated, the factor at Chilton Castle. I surveyed him with surprise and renewed interest, "'What an agreeable coincidence!' I exclaimed. "'Then uh, perhaps tomorrow you could arrange for me to have a look at the castle.' He seemed scarcely to hear me. "'Yes, uh, yes, of course,' he replied absently. Puzzled and a bit irritated by his air of detachment, I remained silent. He took a deep breath and then spoke rapidly, running some of his words together. "'Robert Chilton Payne, uh, the twelfth Earl of Chilton, was buried in the family vaults one week ago.' Frederick, the young heir and now thirteenth earl, came of age just three days ago. Tonight it is imperative that he be conducted to the secret chamber. I gaped at him in incredulous amazement. For a moment I had an idea that he had somehow heard of my interest in Chilton Castle and was merely pulling my leg for amusement in the belief that I was the greenest of gullible tourists. But there could be no mistaking his deadly seriousness there was not the faintest suspicion of humour in his eyes. I groped for words. It, it seems so strange, so unbelievable. Just before you arrived, I had been thinking about the various legends connected with the secret room. His cold eyes held my own. It is not legend that confronts us. It is fact. A thrill of fear and excitement ran through me. You're going there tonight? He nodded. Tonight, myself, uh, the young earl, and one other. I stared at him. Ordinarily, he continued, the earl himself would accompany us. Uh, that is the custom. But he is dead. Shortly before he passed away, he instructed me to select someone to go with the young earl and myself. That person must be male and, uh, preferably, of the blood. I took a deep drink of ale and said not a word. He continued. Besides the young earl, there is no one at the castle save his elderly mother, Lady Beatrice Chilton, and an ailing aunt. What could the earl have had in mind? I inquired cautiously. The factor frowned. There are some distant male cousins residing in the country. I have an idea he thought at least one of them might appear for the obsequies, uh, but not one of them did. Oh, that was most unfortunate, I observed. Extremely unfortunate and I am therefore asking you, as one of the blood, to accompany the young earl and myself to the secret room tonight. I gulped like a bumpkin. Lightning flashed against the windows, and I could hear rain swishing along the stones outside. When feathers of ice stopped fluttering in my stomach, I managed a reply. But I, that is, uh, my relationship is so very remote. I am uh, of the blood, by courtesy only, you might say. The strain in me is so very diluted, he shrugged. You bear the name, and you possess at least a few drops of the pain blood. Under the present urgent circumstances, no more is necessary. 
I am sure that the old earl would agree with me, could he still speak. You will come. There was no escaping the intensity and the pressure of those cold blue eyes. They seemed to follow my mind about as it groped for further excuses. Finally, inevitably it seemed, I agreed. A feeling grew in me that the meeting had been preordained, that somehow I had always been destined to visit the secret chamber in Chilton Castle. We finished our drinks, and I went up to my room for rainwear. When I descended, suitably attired for the storm, the obese bartender was snoring on his stool, in spite of the savage crashes of thunder which had now become almost incessant. I envied him as I left the cosy room with William Coworth. Once outside, my guide informed me that we would have to go on foot to the castle. He had purposely walked down to the inn, he explained, in order that he might have time and solitude to straighten out in his own mind the things which he would have to do. The sheets of heavy rain, the strong wind and the roar of thunder made conversation difficult. I walked Indian fashion behind the factor, who took enormous strides and appeared to know every inch of the way, in spite of the darkness. We walked only a short distance down the village street, and then struck into a side road, which very soon dwindled to a footpath made slippery and treacherous by the driving rain. Abruptly the path began to ascend. The footing became more precarious. It was at once necessary to concentrate all one's attention on one's feet. Fortunately, the flashes of lightning were frequent. It seemed to me that we had been walking for an hour. Actually, I suppose, it was only a few minutes when the factor finally stopped. I found myself standing beside him on a flat, rocky plateau. He pointed up an incline which rose before us. Chilton Castle, he said. For a moment I saw nothing in the unrelieved darkness. Then the lightning flashed. Beyond high battlemented walls fissured with age, I glimpsed a great square Norman castle with four rectangular corner towers pierced by narrow window apertures which looked like evil slitted eyes. The huge weathered pile was half covered by a mantle of ivy which appeared more black than green. It looks incredibly old, I commented. William Coweth nodded. It was begun in 1122 by Henry de Montagis. Without another word, he started up the incline. As we approached the castle wall, the storm grew worse. The slanting rain and powerful wind now made speech all but impossible. We bent our heads and staggered upwards. When the wall finally loomed in front of us, I was amazed at its height and thickness. It had been constructed, obviously, to withstand the best siege guns and battering rams which its early enemies could bring to bear on it. As we crossed a massive timbered drawbridge, I peered down into the black ditch of a moat, but I could not be sure whether there was water in it. A low, arched gateway gave access through the wall to an inner, cobblestoned courtyard. This courtyard was entirely empty, save for rivulets of rushing water. Crossing the cobblestones with swift strides, the factor led me to another arched gateway, in yet another wall. Inside was a second smaller yard, and beyond spread the ivy-clutched base of the ancient keep itself. Traversing a darkened stone-flagged passage, we found ourselves facing a ponderous door, age-blackened, oak-reinforced, with pitted bands of iron. The factor flung open this door, and there before us was the great hall of the castle. Four long, hand-hewn tables with their accompanying benches stretched almost the entire length of the hall. Metal torch brackets stained with age were affixed to sculptured stone columns which supported the roof. Ranged around the walls were suits of armour, heraldic shields, halberds, pikes and banners, the accumulated trophies and prizes of bloody centuries when each castle was almost a kingdom unto itself. In flickering candlelight, which appeared to be the only illumination, the grim array was eerily impressive. William Coweth waved a hand. The holders of Chilton lived by the sword for many centuries. Walking the length of the great hall, he entered another dim passageway. I followed silently. As we strode along, he spoke in a subdued voice. 
Frederick, the young heir, uh, does not enjoy robust health. The shock of his father's death was severe. He dreads tonight's ordeal, which he knows must come. Stopping before a wooden door embellished with carved fleur-de-lis and metal scrollwork, he gave me a shadowed, enigmatic glance, and then knocked. Someone inquired who was there, and he identified himself. Presently, a heavy bolt was lifted, and the door opened. If the Chilton Paines had been stubborn fighters in their day, the warrior blood appeared to have become considerably diluted in the veins of Frederick, the young heir and now thirteenth earl. I saw before me a thin, pale-complexioned young man, whose dark, sunken eyes looked haunted and fearful. His dress was both theatrical and anachronistic, a dark green velvet coat and trousers, a green satin waistband, flounces of white lace at neck and wrists. He beckoned us in, as if with reluctance, and closed the door. The walls of the small room were entirely covered with tapestries depicting the hunt or medieval battle scenes. A draught of air from a window or other aperture made them undulate constantly. They seemed to have a disturbing life of their own. In one corner of the room there was an antique canopy bed, in another a large writing table with an agate lamp. After a brief introduction, which included an explanation of how I came to be accompanying them, the factor inquired if his lordship was ready to visit the chamber. Although he was one in any case, Frederick's face now lost every last trace of colour. He nodded, however, and preceded us into the passage. William Cowarth led the way, the young earl followed him, and I brought up the rear. At the far end of the passage, the factor opened the door of a cobwebbed supply room. Here he secured candles, chisels, a pick, and a sledgehammer. After packing these into a leather bag which he slung over one shoulder, he picked up a faggot torch which lay on one of the shelves in the room. He lit this, then waited while it flared into a steady flame. Satisfied with this illumination, he closed the room, and beckoned for us to continue after him. Nearby was a descending spiral of stone steps. Lifting his torch, the factor started down. We trailed after him wordlessly. There must have been fifty steps in that long downward spiral. As we descended, the stones became wet and cold. The air, too, grew colder. But the cold was not of the type that refreshes. It was too laden with the smell of mould and dampness. At the bottom of the steps we faced a tunnel, pitch black and silent. The factor raised his torch. Chilton Castle is Norman, but it is said to have been reared over a Saxon ruin. It is believed that the passageways in these depths were constructed by the Saxons, he peered frowning into the tunnel, or by some still earlier folk. He hesitated briefly, and I thought he was listening. Then, glancing round at us, he proceeded down the passage. I walked after the earl, shivering. The dead, icy air seemed to pierce to the pith of my bones. The stones underfoot grew slippery with a film of slime. I longed for more light, but there was none, save that cast by the flickering, bobbing torch of the factor. Partway down the passage, he paused and again I sensed that he was listening. The silence seemed absolute, however, and we went on. The end of the passage brought us to more descending steps. We went down some fifteen and entered another tunnel which appeared to have been cut out of the solid rock on which the castle had been reared. White crusted nitre clung to the walls. The reek of mould was intense. The icy air was fetid with some other odour, which I found peculiarly repellent, though I could not name it. At last the factor stopped, lifted his torch, and slid the leather bag from his shoulder. I saw that we stood before a wall made of some kind of building stone. Though damp and stained with nitre, it was obviously of much more recent construction than anything we had previously encountered. Glancing round at us, William Cowarth handed me the torch. 
keep a good hold on it, if you please. I have candles, but... Leaving the sentence unfinished, he drew the pick from his sling bag and began an assault on the wall. The barry was solid enough, but after he had worked a hole in it, he took up the sledgehammer and quicker progress was made. Once I offered to take up the hammer while he held the torch, but he only shook his head and went on with his work of demolition. All this time the young earl had not spoken a word. As I looked at his tense white face, I felt sorry for him, in spite of my own mounting trepidation. Abruptly there was silence as the factor lowered the sledgehammer. I saw that a good two feet of the lower wall remained. William Coworth bent to inspect it. Strong enough, he commented cryptically. I will leave that to build on. We can step over it. For a full minute he stood looking silently into the blackness beyond. Finally, shouldering his bag, he took the torch from my hand and stepped over the ragged base of the wall. We followed suit. As I entered that chamber, the fetid odour which I had noticed in the passage seemed to overwhelm us. It washed round us in a nauseating wave, and we all gasped for breath. The factor spoke between coughs. It, it will subside in a minute or two. Stand near the aperture. Although the reek remained repellently strong, we could at length breathe more freely. William Coworth lifted his torch and peered into the black depths of the chamber. Fearfully, I gazed around his shoulder. There was no sound, and at first I could see nothing but nitre-encrusted walls and wet stone floor. Presently, however, in a far corner, just beyond the flickering halo of the faggot torch, I saw two tiny, fiery spots of red. I tried to convince myself that they were two red jewels, two rubies shining in the torchlight. But I knew at once, I felt at once, what they were. They were two red eyes, and they were watching us with a fierce, unwavering stare. The factor spoke softly. Wait here. He crossed towards the corner, stopped halfway and held out his torch at arm's length. For a moment he was silent. Finally he emitted a long, shuddering sigh. When he spoke again his voice had changed. It was only a sepulchral whisper. Come forward, he told us in that strange, hollow voice. I followed Frederick until we stood at either side of the factor. When I saw what crouched on a stone bench in that far corner, I felt sure that I would faint. My heart literally stopped beating for perceptible seconds. The blood left my extremities. I reeled with dizziness. I might have cried out, but my throat would not open. The entity which rested on that stone bench was like something that had crawled up out of hell. Piercing, malignant eyes proclaimed that it had a terrible life, and yet that life sustained itself in a black, shrunken, half-mummified body which resembled a disinterred corpse. A few mouldy rags clung to the cadaver-like frame. Wisps of white hair sprouted out of its ghastly grey-white skull, a red smear or blotch of some sort covered the wizened slit which served it as a mouth. It surveyed us with a malignancy which was beyond anything merely human. It was impossible to stare back into those monstrous red eyes. They were so inexpressibly evil, one felt that one's soul would be consumed in the fires of their malevolence. Glancing aside, I saw that the factor was now supporting Frederick. The young heir had sagged against him, staring fixedly at the fearful apparition with terror-glazed eyes. In spite of my own sense of horror, I pitied him. The factor sighed again, and then he spoke once more in that low, sepulchral voice. You see before you, he told us, Lady Susan Glanville. She was carried into this chamber and fettered to the wall. 
1473. The thrill of horror coursed through me. I felt that we were in the presence of malign forces from the pit itself. To me, the hideous thing had appeared sexless, but at the sound of its name, the ghastly mockery of a grin contorted the puckered, red-smeared mouth. I noticed now for the first time that the monster actually was secured to the wall. The great double shackles were so blackened with age I had not noticed them before. The factor went on as if he spoke by rote. Lady Glanville was a maternal ancestor of the Chiltern Pains. She had commerce with the devil. She was condemned as a witch, but escaped the stake. Finally, her own people forcibly overcame her. She was brought in here, fettered, and left to die. He was silent a moment, and then continued. It was too late. She had already made a pact with the powers of darkness. It was an unspeakably evil thing, and it has condemned her issue to a life of torment and nightmare, a life of terror and dread. He swung his torch towards the black and red-eyed thing. She was a beauty once. She hated death, she feared death, and so she finally bartered her own immortal soul and the bodies of her issue for eternal earthly life. I heard his voice as in a nightmare. It seemed to be coming from an infinite distance. He went on. The consequences of breaking the pact are too terrible to describe. No descendant of hers has ever dared to do so, once the forfeit is known. And so she has bided here for these nearly five hundred years. I had thought he was finished, but he resumed. Glancing upwards, he lifted his torch toward the roof of that accursed chamber. This room, he said, lies directly underneath the family vaults. Upon the death of the earl, the body is ostensibly left in the vaults. When the mourners have gone, however, a false bottom of the vault is thrust aside, and the body of the earl is lowered into this room. Looking up, I saw the square rectangle of a trapdoor above. The factor's voice now became barely audible. Once, every generation, Lady Glanville feeds on the corpse of the deceased Earl. It is a provision of that unspeakable pact which cannot be broken. I knew now, with a sense of horror utterly beyond description, whence came that red smear on the repulsive mouth of the creature before us. As if to confirm his words, the factor lowered his torch until its flame illuminated the floor at the foot of the stone bench where the vampiric monster was fettered. Strewn about the floor were the scattered bones and skull of an adult male, red with fresh blood, and at some distance were other human bones, brown and crumbling with age. At this point, Frederick began to scream. His shrill, hysterical cries filled the chamber. Although the factor shook him roughly, his terrible shrieks continued, terror-filled, nerve-shaking. For moments the corpse-like thing on the bench watched him with its frightful eyes. It uttered sound, finally, a kind of animal squeal which might have been intended as laughter. Abruptly then, and without any warning, it slid from the bench and lunged towards the young earl. The blackened shackles which fettered it to the wall permitted it to advance only a yard or two. It was pulled back sharply, yet it lunged again and again, squealing with a kind of hellish glee which stirred the hair on my head. William Coworth thrust his torch towards the monster, but it continued to lunge at the end of its fetters. The nightmare room resounded with the earl's screams and the creature's horrible squeals of bestial laughter. I felt that my own mind would give way unless I escaped from that ante-room of hell. For the first time during an ordeal which would have sent any lesser man fleeing for his life and sanity, the iron control of the factor appeared to be shaken. He looked beyond the wild lunging thing towards the wall where the fetters were fastened. I sensed what was in his mind. 
would those fastenings hold after all these centuries of rust and dampness? On a sudden resolve, he reached into an inner pocket and drew out something which glittered in the torchlight. It was a silver crucifix. Standing forward, he thrust it almost into the twisted face of the leaping monstrosity, which had once been the ravishing Lady Susan Glanville. The creature reeled back with an agonized scream which drowned out the cries of the Earl. It cowered on the bench, abruptly silent and motionless, only the pulsating of its wizened mouth and the fires of hatred in its red eyes giving evidence that it still lived. William Coworth addressed it grimly. Creature of hell, if ye leave that bench ere we quit this room and seal it once again, I swear that I shall hold this cross against ye. The thing's red eyes watched the factor with an expression of abysmal hatred which no combination of mere letters could convey. They actually appeared to glow with fire, and yet I read in them something else. Fear. I suddenly became aware that silence had descended on that room of the damned. It lasted only a few moments. The Earl had finally stopped screaming, but now came something worse. He began to laugh. It was only a low chuckle, but it was somehow worse than all his screams. It went on and on, softly, mindlessly. The factor turned, beckoning me towards the partially demolished wall. Crossing the room, I climbed out. Behind me, the factor led the young earl who shuffled like an old man, chuckling to himself. There was then what seemed an interminable interval, during which the factor carried back a sack of mortar and a keg of water which he had previously left somewhere in the tunnel. Working by torchlight, he prepared the cement and proceeded to seal up the chamber, using the same stones which he had displaced. While the factor laboured, the young earl sat motionless in the tunnel, chuckling softly. There was silence from within. Once only I heard the thing's fetters clank against the stone. At last the factor finished and led us back through those nitre-stained passageways and up the icy stairs. The earl could scarcely ascend. With difficulty the factor supported him from step to step. Back in his tapestry-panelled chamber, Frederick sat on his canopy bed and stared at the floor, laughing quietly. With horror I noticed that his black hair had actually turned grey. After persuading him to drink a glass of liquid, which I had no doubt contained a heavy dose of sedative, the factor managed to get him stretched out on the bed. William Coworth then led me to a nearby bedchamber. My impulse was to rush from that hellish pile without delay, but the storm still raged, and I was by no means sure I could find my way back to the village without a guide. The factor shook his head sadly. I fear his lordship is doomed to an early death. He was never strong, and tonight's events may have deranged his mind, may have weakened him beyond hope of recovery. I expressed my sympathy and horror. The factor's cold blue eyes held my own. It may be, he said, that in the event of the young earl's death, you, yourself, might be considered, he hesitated, might be considered, he finally concluded, as somewhat in line of succession. I wanted to hear no more. I gave him a curt good night, bolted the door after him, and tried, quite unsuccessfully, to salvage a few minutes' sleep. But sleep would not come. I had feverish visions of that red-eyed thing in the sealed chamber, escaping its fetters, breaking through the wall and crawling up those icy, slime-covered stairs. Even before dawn, I softly unbolted my door and, like a marauding thief, crept shivering through the cold passageways and the great deserted hall of the castle. Crossing the cobbled courtyard and the black moat, I scrambled down the incline towards the village. Long before noon I was well on my way to London. Luck was with me. The next day 
I was on a boat bound for the Atlantic run. I shall never return to England. I intend always to keep Chilton Castle and its permanent occupant at least an ocean away. The Catacomb by Peter Shilston I am retelling this story as it was retold to me. Imagine, if you can, a coach making a tour of the island of Sicily in the middle of August, carrying a couple of dozen English package holidaymakers on the usual lightning inspection of places of interest. Palermo in two days, Agrigento in another two, Syracuse meriting only one, a trip by chairlift up Mount Etna and then home. The sort of people one finds on such tours are invariably the same. A number of school teachers, earnest retired couples, parents who have inappropriately brought children and are beginning to wonder why they didn't save themselves trouble by going to the beach instead, and a handful of single, unattached people. Furthermore, their behaviour is always the same. Some spend all their time grumbling at the quality of the hotels and food. The young men wonder why there are no available attractive young ladies on the tour. The children get bored and the school teachers carry guidebooks and maps around everywhere and take enormous numbers of photographs. Others seem to show no interest in historical sites at all and spend all their time either sitting in the nearest cafe or buying various unpleasant souvenirs. This particular coach party was a typical one, I think. Among its members was a certain Mr Pearsall, a quiet, a solitary middle-aged man of vaguely scholarly appearance. He had enjoyed the tour and had been duly impressed by the Greek temples of Agrigento and the mosaics in the great cathedral at Monreale. But he hadn't managed to make close friends of any of the other passengers, and now that the holiday had only a couple of days left to run, he was looking forward to getting back home again. Consequently, He was mildly irritated when old Mrs Tavistock in the back of the coach started to complain of stomach pains. She had been something of a moaner throughout the tour, but now she was looking genuinely ill, with the result that Giuliano, the courier, had to ask the driver to stop in the next town so that a doctor could be brought. The next town turned out to be a nondescript settlement nestling beneath an enormous cliff with little apart from this huge overshadowing presence to distinguish it from any one of fifty other small towns that they'd already passed through on the tour. Here Giuliano went in search of a medical man, leaving his charges dozing, idly reading their books or making desultory conversation. It was mid-afternoon and the sun was blazing fiercely. All sensible Sicilians were indoors having a siesta. Shutters were down on every window and not a soul was visible in the street. After a while, Giuliano returned and regretted to inform them that they would have to wait at least an hour for Mrs Tavistock to receive attention before they could proceed. In the meantime, they could get out and stretch their legs, though it was unlikely that they would find anywhere open. The coach would sound its horn to call them back when it was time to go. Here he engaged in an animated conversation in Italian with Umberto, the driver, who made many emphatic gestures the upshot of which was some more unencouraging information. The local people, said Giuliano, kept themselves very much to themselves, and there were really no facilities for tourists at all. No coaches normally stopped here, and there was little point in trying to explore the town. Really, it had nothing to offer. He expressed his regret again and had a few more words with Umberto. Mr Pearsall's command of Italian wasn't great, but he seemed to detect the phrase, can't come to much harm if they're all together. Mr Pearsall, however, did not intend to stay with the others as they stood around on the pavement in a pointless fashion. He had glimpsed a church down a side street as they drove into town. It had looked old and surprisingly large for such an insignificant place, and he thought it might just be worth an exploratory visit. The harm Giuliano had mentioned, uh, assuming he'd understood him right, he took to mean thieves. They had been warned to beware of bag snatchers in the major cities, but it was hardly likely that gangs of muggers would bother to patrol a town where no tourists ever stopped. The streets seemed absolutely deserted. Besides, Mr Pearsall was still quite fit, and imagined he could hold his own against the average thief, or at the very worst, run fast enough to get away. So taking his camera, he imparted his intended destination to a fellow passenger, 
who showed not the slightest inclination to accompany him, and set out at a brisk pace. The side streets of the town were very narrow and ran steeply up the hill towards the great beetling overhang of the cliff. Some of them had steps in them. Mr. Pearsall wondered how claustrophobic it would be to live beneath that great black shadow, and also speculated whether the town was ever damaged by rock falls. After a couple of turns into dead ends, he found himself in a little gravel-strewn square, as devoid of people as the rest of the town, and facing the church itself. A glance at the sun told him that he was approaching it from the west end. The southeastern corner of it almost touched the base of the cliff. Because it had exactly the same colour and texture as that towering mass, the church gave the slightly disturbing impression of having been carved by the hand of a giant in a single piece out of the living rock. His first sensation, Mr. Pearsall tells us, was of great age and general dilapidation. The church looked far older than the Doric temples at Agrigento, which he had admired earlier in the week, though his intellect told him this couldn't possibly be the case. He supposed it must be a Norman building, though possibly on an older foundation, Arabic or even Roman. The style was typical enough, though rather ill-proportioned. Two squat heavy towers with hardly any windows, and those very small, flanked a portico of three large pointed arches. What little decoration there had ever been was now barely discernible. There seemed at one time to have been fresco paintings inside the portico, but now the plaster was badly cracked and in some places fallen away entirely. Only a few dim outlines of human figures, presumably saints, could be discovered. There was a large wooden door, decayed and worm-eaten, with panels carved in what had been ornate abstract patterns. Moorish influence, said Pearsall to himself, and tried the door. It was locked. This was predictable enough under the circumstances, but still annoying. Mr. Pearsall retreated to the square to take a picture, and then looked at his watch. A mere fifteen minutes had passed since he left the coach, and he still had plenty of time to kill. The day was hotter than ever, and if there were any shops in his godforsaken place, they were resolutely shut. He decided to stroll round the outside of the church for sheer lack of anything else to do. Besides, he would be in the shade for part of his walk, and it would be cooler. Without any great enthusiasm, he set out. He was a mild-tempered man. But if there was one thing that caused him irritation, it was suddenly finding himself with nothing whatsoever to do when he had expected to be occupied. Along the south side of the church, the shuttered houses ran so close that the street was more like a tunnel. He hadn't gone far when he noticed a small side door. It should cause us no great surprise that he tried to open it, and much to his gratification found it wasn't locked. Surprised at his good fortune and congratulating himself on his persistence, he went inside. At first there was nothing to be seen, so dark was the interior after the savagery of the afternoon glare outside. But soon Mr. Pearsall's eyes had grown accustomed to the gloom, and he was able to look around him. He knew at once that his walk had been worthwhile. In his tidy fashion he began to classify what he could see. A long high nave with aisles on either side, clearly another Norman church, with the pointed arches learned from the Arabs. But unlike some of the others he'd seen on his visit, this church hadn't been revamped later on in the Baroque period. There was not a Corinthian pilaster to be seen. The capitals of the column seemed to be a mass of grotesque carvings, but were so thick with grime that he couldn't distinguish them clearly. Indeed, the whole interior was very dirty. The pews were thick with dust and the candles so discoloured that they looked as if they hadn't been lit in years. Clearly they weren't expecting visitors, for there was not a guidebook or a postcard visible anywhere. Then Mr. Pearsall saw the mosaics. He had already been initiated into the marvels which the Normans had bequeathed to Sicily in this field, in such staggering compilations as the cathedral at Monreale and the Palatine Chapel in Palermo. But even so, the examples of the art on display at this out-of-the-way place quite took his breath away. Here, some nameless craftsmen of the twelfth century had taken the Byzantine style and interpreted it with a vigour and a liveliness that were all his own. 
A veritable poor man's Bible of astonishing power covered the walls. Mr. Pearsall quite forgot the passing of time as he followed the treasures on display. Here was the creation of the world in a sequence of seven pictures, and there were Adam and Eve tempted by the servant and expelled from paradise. More scenes followed, Cain murdering Abel, the building of the ark, the drunkenness of Noah, the Tower of Babel, Abraham and the destruction of the cities of the plain, the sacrifice of Isaac, on and on, each one more startling than the last. How odd, thought Mr. Pearsall, as he moved from scene to scene, full of wonder and admiration, that the inhabitants of this town should discourage tourists. Here they had some of the finest mosaics on the island, if not in the whole of Italy, and yet they were left to decay out of sight in a locked and dirty church. Why, with just a little initiative and energy from the town's authorities, visitors would surely come flocking to see such marvels. Did they object to the very idea of tourists? Surely there were enough prospective cafe owners and postcard dealers in the place to insist that something was done. And why was the church not mentioned in any of the guidebooks which he had read so assiduously before starting on his tour? Such were the musings that passed through Mr. Pearsall's mind. But after a while, he began to have doubts. It became noticeable that though the artist had great natural vigour, it was the portrayal of evil which called forth his finest efforts. The serpent in the Garden of Eden, for instance, was given a human face that bore a sinister and seductive leer. In the story of Cain and Abel, there was no doubt that it was Cain who was intended as the hero, for Abel, as he lay helpless on the ground, was a mere hapless simpleton, whereas his murderer, standing over him with a spade raised to cleave his skull, was full of savage power. King Nimrod's soldiers at Babel looked like mindless automata. The picture of Saul and the Witch of Endor was situated in the darkest corner of the church, perhaps deliberately, and was covered with cobwebs. After examining it closely, Mr. Pearsall was almost glad of this, for inside the witch's cave were certain unpleasant, non-human shapes that were perhaps well left unseen. Perhaps the artist was a Manichaean, mused Mr. Pearsall, a Cathar or an Albigensian, or are they the same thing? Have I got the dates right? More convinced of the existence of evil than of good. Perhaps his mosaics were condemned as heretical. But in that case, why weren't they destroyed instead of just closing the church down? Now, I wonder what he's made of the New Testament. These mosaics were even more unsettling. Mr. Pearsall couldn't find an annunciation or even a nativity, but there was a quite horribly realistic massacre of the innocents, in which a number of ingenious and disgusting means had been devised of slaughtering the children whilst King Herod sat on his throne overlooking the carnage, and laughed. The portrayal of Judas receiving his thirty pieces of silver from Caiaphas would have stood out as one of the artistic masterpieces of all time, were it not so exceedingly unpleasant. And so it progressed through various nasty portrayals of people possessed by devils, through the stories of Simon Magus and Ananias, both of whom once again were the most vivid characterizations in their particular scenes, right up to a terrifyingly powerful portrayal of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. By this time, not only was Mr. Pearsall distinctly upset by the mosaics, but he was feeling increasingly ill at ease. At first, the church had been completely silent, but as time went on, it seemed full of little noises he couldn't locate. His footsteps echoed round and round in a long diminuendo, but they seemed to be answered by odd rustlings and creakings. No doubt these were the normal sounds of rodent life or of aged woodwork at the start of its death throes. But when, like Mr. Pearsall, one is alone in an ancient church in the middle of a strange town, when not a single human inhabitant has yet shown his face, and when furthermore one is surrounded by the most disturbing illustrations of biblical evil, such rational explanations carry distinctly less force. 
Once or twice he held his breath and stood perfectly still to see if the noises continued. Not only that, he also increasingly felt that he was being watched. Probably it was only the faces in the mosaics that caused this, but on more than one occasion he thought he saw a movement right in the corner of his field of vision and whirled around in alarm, only to find nothing. Finally he came to a Virgin Mary who was quite devoid of the usual serenity, but instead had the voluptuousness of a vampire. So appalling was her expression that he thought for a while she must be a portrayal of the scarlet whore of Babylon. But no, she had the posture and the usual clothing of the Virgin, and there in her arms was the Christ child, a hideous infant with an oily and sanctimonious grin which put Mr. Pearsall in mind of a satiated appetite for something perverse. He shuddered and was filled with a sensation of such acute distaste that for a moment he quite forgot the noises. All this time he had avoided looking at the East End, intending to keep till last his viewing of what was always the glory of the Sicilian churches, the great figure of Christ in the apse above the altar. Now he could keep from it no longer, and turned his gaze in that direction. It was indeed a masterpiece, in spite of the dirt and the cobwebs that encrusted it. As usual, Christ's head and shoulders were portrayed robed in red and blue, the right arm extended in blessing, the left holding an open book lettered in Greek. The treatment of the material by the unknown artist was marvellous, but the expression on Christ's face was uniquely horrible. A malignant sneer of contempt. The eyes were very piercing. Mr. Pearsall couldn't read Greek, but he suspected that the words written on the open page of the book were hardly a normal scriptural text. And the right hand, was that the usual gesture of blessing? Or was it the first and last fingers held up the gesture known as the devil's horns? This is a blasphemous church, said Mr. Pearsall to himself. The mosaics may be very fine, but they are also very horrible. Some bishop, perhaps even the Pope, condemned them and had the church closed down. Even the townspeople don't like to talk about them because they are still a very religious people, and they don't let tourists in. Just as well, these pictures are enough to give anyone nightmares. Well, I'm glad I've seen them, but it's not a pleasant place to visit on your own, and I can't say I'll be sorry to leave. He glanced at his watch and was almost relieved to find that his hour had practically expired. It gave him an excuse to leave without exploring the rest of the church. With a brisk walk that an unsympathetic observer might have thought perilously close to a panic-stricken run, he turned away towards the south door by which he had entered. But now it was locked. For some time Mr. Pearsall struggled in a quite futile fashion, shaking the door, twisting the iron ring this way and that, searching for a catch, but he was entirely unable to shift it. He thumped the door with the palm of his hand and kicked it, and a great ringing boom echoed round the church like a salvo of cannon fire, and to this day he swears that from somewhere there came a kind of sinister chuckle in answer. With a considerable effort he pulled himself together. This is stupid, he told himself. There's probably some custodian who forgot to lock the church up before his siesta and only realised his mistake when he woke up. But he must be a very careless or stupid man, or he would have checked to see if anyone had gone inside. All the same, he didn't want to knock again and risk that dreadful echo, so he decided to search for another door that might be open. Logic suggested that there should be one on the north side, perhaps opening to a cloister or something similar. Crossing the nave with a certain trepidation and carefully avoiding a glance at the blasphemous figure of Christ, though he imagined he could sense the cruel eyes bearing on him with an almost tangible force, he went in search. Sure enough, there was a door in the corner of the north aisle, and it wasn't locked, though it seemed a long time since it had been opened. A strong thrust was needed to shift it, and it groaned horribly as it swung inwards, dislodging a shower of dirt. A peculiar, musty smell seeped into the air. 
Mr. Pearsall found himself peering at a flight of worn stone steps running downwards into the darkness. Now, this didn't look like the way out at all. Indeed, the smell suggested that the lower chamber, whatever it was, was completely sealed from the outer air, and had been so for a very long time. It was a most unpromising route for one wishing to leave the building, and to this day, Mr. Pearsall has never been able to give a satisfactory explanation of why he decided to descend those steps. He was already late, and after the unsettling effect of the mosaics, most of his exploratory zeal had evaporated, but nonetheless he could not resist the lure of the doorway. He wondered afterwards whether he was in full control of his movements any more. The whole place bore a distinctly sinister air, but still he had to push the door fully open and take his first tentative steps down into the darkness. The stairs were long and curiously dank in spite of the dryness of the climate. Soon all trace of the light of the main body of the church, which had itself seemed so gloomy when he had first entered, had been lost, and he was obliged to take his cigarette lighter from his pocket and proceeded by its flickering illumination. He turned the corner beneath a glowering archway of uncut stone, descended a ramp, and gasped at what he saw. It was a catacomb. A long corridor opened before him with side passages running from it. Perhaps the whole area beneath the nave was covered, and it was inhabited. A long double line of human forms stood along each passage. All ages and classes had their representatives here men and women and infants, monks and warriors, learned scholars and ladies of fashion. They were dressed in clothes that must once have been their finest, furs and silks and embroidered gowns, now sadly mouldering and decayed, but bearing still a glimmer of their former glories. And they had faces, for clearly much ingenuity had been expended to preserve the bodies, though with mixed degrees of success. There was a girl child whose clothing looked at least two hundred years old, but who from her skin and hair might just have fallen asleep. But beyond her, a man in priestly robes who'd lost his nose and his cheeks and his eyes had decayed to blank, milky globules. And further on, the soldier in the chased steel breastplate, who was perhaps a mercenary from the Renaissance period, had lost his flesh entirely and now grinned mindlessly with a naked skull. Poor Mr. Pearsall. The effect would have been quite nasty enough under bright electric lights and surrounded by his fellow tourists, but here, on his own, locked in, and after already being alarmed and upset by those hideous mosaics, and furthermore with just a single weak flame to protect him from the darkness, the shock was overwhelming. Quite why he didn't turn and bolt, he's never managed to explain. He takes refuge in mysterious talk of feeling a call which dragged him onwards. Certainly it is irrefutable that he walked on down the passage, through the grisly ranks of the dead, horror mounting within him, but quite unable to save himself. All the bodies had been there a very long time. Mr. Pearsall's knowledge of the history of costumes was not great, but he was fairly certain that none of the garments worn could be placed any later than the middle 18th century, and the majority seemed to be medieval. What was left of his rational mind told him that similar catacombs were not unknown elsewhere. But such a piece of information seemed extraordinarily useless. As he walked onwards, he appeared to be moving back steadily in time towards the early Middle Ages. Very few of the faces had any flesh on them by this time. Some were left almost naked with their clothing in flimsy rags, and others had simply fallen and lay in heaps on the floor. But still he had to go onwards until he reached the end. He had lost now all sense of direction, but suspected he was moving beneath the altar, beneath the Christ of the devil's horns blessing and the malevolent glance. And here was the centre of this labyrinth of death, a great throne of gilded wood, much rotted, 
where sat a body clad in the gorgeous robes and mitre of a bishop. This much Mr. Pearsall took in at a distance, but as he drew near, he wouldn't look at the figure directly. He tried to force his eyes to look only at the slippers. He was sure he would lose his reason if he looked higher, but he could not fight as a force stronger than his mind raised his head gradually higher. The gold-embroidered cope the skeletal hands with the episcopal ring loosely enclosing a bony finger, the crozier propped up in the other hand, the bones of the face bare of all flesh, the grinning yellow teeth, the eyes, the eyes, not decayed at all, but alive, piercing glaring. My God, the same eyes as Christ in the mosaic. The lighter fell from Mr. Pearsall's nerveless grasp and he plunged into darkness. It was a lighter of cylindrical shape and he heard it roll tinkling away out of his reach. For a few seconds he scrambled uselessly on the floor for it, then realised how pointless such a search was. He would have to find his way out in total darkness. How far was it? How many turns had he taken? He waved his arms in front and to either side, walked a few paces, touched stone, turned, walked more until he met another obstacle, turned again. It was at this stage that he began to hear noises again, a horrible, dry rustling, which he would have loved to think was a rat. It came from behind him. He moved quicker and walked slap into one of the bodies. His face buried itself in the rotting fabric and he felt the lifeless arms slump across his shoulders. His nerves snapped entirely and he screamed. A muffled noise quickly extinguished. He ran at random, hit another body and ran again and struck again. Corpses were collapsing all around him, but still there was a rustling and a padding and a dry, gravelly cackling behind him. And it too was moving, not fast, but soon it would reach him if he couldn't find the stairs. He fell and cut his hands and screamed again, but not from pain. He lost count of how many times he smashed into obstacles until, bruised and bleeding, he could go no further and cowered back against the stone wall. The rustling was quite close now. Light, he must have light. He'd lost his cigarette lighter. He had no matches. Frantically, his hands searched his pockets for a miracle. Of course, he had flash cubes for his camera. With trembling fingers, he pulled one out and fiddled for what seemed an eternity to fit it in place. He pressed the shutter button and nothing happened. A dud. He turned it round and tried once more. Still nothing. The rustling was only inches away. Think, man, think. He'd forgotten to wind on the film, so of course nothing would happen. Pull round the winding lever and try again. Just time... He must have fainted. But when he awoke, it was bright daylight and he was lying on the back seat of the coach. Giuliano was leaning over him. The courier had been told where Mr. Pearsall had gone, and when he failed to return on time, Giuliano and Umberto had gone to the church to find him. Entering by the south door, which, by the by, they emphatically denied was locked, they heard his screams from the crypt and saw the flash. They found him without much difficulty was within a few yards of the steps. Giuliano was more relieved than annoyed, but he chided Mr. Pearsall for disturbing the bodies in the catacomb. Banging into them in the dark was careless and destructive, but as for deliberately dragging one body all that way from its resting place, and it being the body of a bishop too! Mr. Pearsall didn't have the strength to argue. The Rats in the Walls by H. P. Lovecraft on July 16th, 1923, I moved into Exham Priory after the last workman had finished his labours. The restoration had been a stupendous task, for little had remained of the deserted pile but a shell-like ruin. Yet, because it had been the seat of my ancestors, I let no expense deter me. The place had not been inhabited since the reign of James I, 
when a tragedy of intensely hideous, though largely unexplained nature, had struck down the master, five of his children, and several servants, and driven forth under a cloud of suspicion and terror the third son, my lineal progenitor, and the only survivor of the abhorred line. With this sole heir denounced as a murderer, the estate had reverted to the crown, nor had the accused man made any attempt to exculpate himself or regain his property. Shaken by some horror greater than that of conscience or the law, and expressing only a frantic wish to exclude the ancient edifice from his sight and memory, Walter de la Poor, eleventh Baron Exum, fled to Virginia, and there founded the family which, by the next century, had become known as Delapore. Exum Priory had remained untenanted, though later allotted to the estates of the Norris family, and much studied because of its peculiarly composite architecture. An architecture involving Gothic towers resting on a Saxon or Romanesque substructure, whose foundation in turn was of a still earlier order or blend of orders, Roman and even Druidic or native Cymric, if legends speak truly. This foundation was a very singular thing, being merged on one side with the solid limestone of the precipice from whose brink the priory overlooked a desolate valley three miles west of the village of Anchester. Architects and antiquarians loved to examine this strange relic of forgotten centuries, but the country folk hated it. They had hated it hundreds of years before, when my ancestors lived there, and they hated it now, with the moss and mould of abandonment on it. I had not been a day in Anchester before I knew I came of an accursed house, and this week workmen have blown up Exon Priory and are busy obliterating the traces of its foundations. The bare statistics of my ancestry I had always known, together with the fact that my first American forebear had come to the colonies under a strange cloud. Of details, however, I had been kept wholly ignorant through the policy of reticence always maintained by the Delapores. Unlike our planter neighbours, we seldom boasted of crusading ancestors or other medieval and renaissance heroes, nor was any kind of tradition handed down except what may have been recorded in the sealed envelope left before the civil war by every squire to his eldest son for posthumous opening. The glories we cherished were those achieved since the migration, the glories of a proud and honourable, if somewhat reserved and unsocial Virginia line. During the war, our fortunes were extinguished, and our whole existence changed by the burning of Carfax, our home on the banks of the James. My grandfather, advanced in years, had perished in that incendiary outrage, and with him the envelope that had bound us all to the past. I can recall that fire today as I saw it then at the age of seven, with the federal soldiers shouting, the women screaming, and the negroes howling and praying. My father was in the army, defending Richmond, and after many formalities, my mother and I were passed through the lines to join him. When the war ended, we all moved north, whence my mother had come, and I grew to manhood, middle age, and ultimate wealth as a stolid Yankee. Neither my father nor I ever knew what our hereditary envelope had contained and as I merged into the greyness of Massachusetts business life, I lost all interest in the mysteries which evidently lurked far back in my family tree. Had I suspected their nature, how gladly I would have left Exon Priory to its moss, baths, and cobwebs. My father died in 1904, but without any message to leave to me, or to my only child, child Alfred, a motherless boy of ten. It was this boy who reversed the order of family, family information, for although I could give him only jesting conjectures about the past, he wrote me of some very interesting ancestral legends when the late war took him to England in 1917 as an aviation officer. Apparently, the Delapores had a colourful and perhaps sinister history, for a friend of my son's, Captain Edward Norris of the Royal Flying Corps, dwelt near the family seat at Anchester 
and related some peasant superstitions which few novelists could equal for wildness and incre incredibility. Norris himself, of course, did not take them so seriously, but they amused my son and made good material for his letters to me. It was this legendary which definitely turned my attentions to my transatlantic heritage and made me resolve to purchase and restore the family seat which Norris showed to Alfred in its picturesque desertion and offered to get for him at a surprisingly reasonable figure since his own uncle was the present owner. I bought Exxon Priory in 1918 but was almost immediately distracted from my plans of restoration by the return of my son as a maimed invalid. During the two years that he lived, I thought of nothing but his care, having even placed my business under the direction of partners. In 1921, as I found myself bereaved and aimless, a retired manufacturer, no longer young, I resolved to divert my remaining years with my new possession. Visiting Anchester in December, I was entertained by Captain Norris, a plump, amiable young man, who had thought much of my son and secured his assistance in gathering plans and anecdotes to guide us in the coming restoration. <clears throat> Exxon Priory itself I saw without emotion, a jumble of tottering medieval ruins covered with lichens and honeycombed with rooks' nests, perched perilously upon a pre precipice, and denuded of floors or other interior features, save the stone walls of the separate towers. Excuse me. As I gradually recovered the image of the edifice as it had been when my ancestors left it over three centuries before, I began to hire workmen for the reconstruction. In every case, I was forced to go outside the immediate locality, for the Anchester villagers had an almost unbelievable fear and hatred of the place. The sentiment was so great that it was sometimes communicated to the outside labourers, causing numerous desertions, whilst its scope appeared to include both the priory and its ancient family. My son had told me that he was somewhat avoided during his visits because he was a de la Poor, and I now found myself subtly ostracised for a like reason, until I convinced the peasants how little I knew of my heritage. Even then they sullenly disliked me so that I had to collect most of the village traditions through the mediation of Norris. <coughs> I told they had a cold. What the people could not forgive, perhaps, was that I had come to restore a symbol so abhorrent to them, for rationally or not, they viewed Exxon Priory as nothing less than a haunt of fiends and werewolves. Piecing together the tales which Norris collected for me, and supplementing them with the accounts of several savants who had studied the ruins, I deduced that Exxon Priory stood on the site of a prehistoric temple, a druidical or anti-druidical thing, which must have been contemporary with Stonehenge. That indescribable rites had been celebrated there, few doubted, and there were unpleasant tales of the transference of these rites into the Sibylli worship which the Romans had introduced. Inscriptions still visible in the subcellar bore such unmistakable letters as Du Ops Magna Mat, sign of the Magna Mater, whose dark worship was once vainly forbidden to Roman citizens. Anchester had been the camp of the Third Augustan Legion, as many remains attest, and it was said that the Temple of Sibylli was splendid and thronged with worshippers who performed nameless ceremonies at the bidding of a Phrygian priest. Tales added that the fall of the old religion did not end the orgies at the temple, but the priests lived on in the new faith without real change. Likewise, it was it said that the rites did not vanish with the Roman power, and that certain among the Saxons added to what remained of the temple and gave it the essential outline it subsequent preserved, making it the centre of a cult feared through half the Heptarchy. About AD 1000, the place is mentioned in a chronicle as being a substantial stone priory, housing a strange, powerful monastic order, and surrounded by extensive gardens which needed no walls to exclude a frightened populace. It was never destroyed by the Danes, though 
after the Norman conquest it must have declined tremendously, since there was no impediment when Henry the Third granted the site to my ancestor, Gilbert de la Poer, first Baron Exum, in twelve sixty one. Of my family before this day there is no evil report. But something strange must have happened then. In one chronicle there is a reference to Adelapur as Cursed of God in thirteen o seven, whilst visit whilst visage whilst village legendary had nothing but evil and frantic fear to tell of the castle that went up on the foundations of the old temple and priory. The fireside tales of the most grisly description, all the ghastlier because of their frightened reticence and cloudly evasiveness. They represented my ancestors as a race of hereditary demons, beside whom Gilles de Retz and the Marquis de Sade would seem the various tyros, and hinted whisperingly at their responsibility for the occasional disappearances of villagers through several generations. The worst characters, apparently, were the barons and their direct heirs. At least most was whispered about them. If of healthier inclinations, it was said, an heir would early and mysteriously die to make way for another more typical scion. There seemed to be an inner cult in the family, presided over by the head of the house, and sometimes closed except to a few members. Temperament rather than ancestry was evidently, evidently the basis of this cult, for it was entered by several who married into the family. Lady Margaret Trevor from Cornwall, wife of Godfrey, the second son of the fifth baron, became a favourite bane of children all over the countryside, and the demon heroine of a particularly horrible old ballad, not extinct yet near the Welsh border. Preserved in balladry too, though not illustrating the same point, is the hideous tale of Lady Mary de la Poor, who shortly after her marriage to the Earl of Shrewsfield was killed by him and his mother, both of the slayers being absolved and blessed by the priest to whom they confessed what they dared not repeat to the world. Excuse me. A second. <coughs> These myths and ballads, typical as they were of crude superstition, repelled me greatly. Their persistence and their application to so long a line of my ancestors were especially annoying, whilst the imputations of monstrous habits proved unpleasantly reminiscent of the one known scandal of my immediate forebears, the case of my cousin, young Randolph de la Poor of Carfax, who went among the Negroes and became a voodoo priest after he returned from the Mexican War. I was much less disturbed by the vaguer tales of wails and howlings in the barren, windswept valley beneath the limestone cliff, of the graveyard stenches after the spring rains, of the floundering, squealing white thing on which Sir John Clave's horse had trod one night in a lonely field, and of the servant who had gone mad at what he saw in the priory in the full light of day. These things were hackneyed spectral law, and I was at that time a pronounced sceptic. The accounts of vanished peasants were less to be dismissed, though not, especially, though not especially significant in view of medieval custom. Prying curiosity meant death, and more than one severed head had been publicly shown on the bastions now effaced around Exum Priory. A few of the tales were exceedingly picturesque and made me wish I had learnt more of the comparative mythology in my youth. There was, for instance, a belief that a legion of bat-winged devils kept witches' sabbath each night at the Priory, a legion whose sustenance might explain the disproportionate abundance of coarse vegetables harvested in the vast gardens. And, most vivid of all, there was the dramatic epic of the rats, the scampering army of obscene vermin which had burst forth from the castle three months after the tragedy that doomed it to desertion, the lean, filthy, ravenous army which had swept all before it and, <clears throat> and devoured fowl, cats, dogs, hogs, sheep, 
and even two hapless human beings before its fury was spent. Around that unforgettable rodent army, a whole separate cycle of myths revolves, for it scattered among the village homes and brought curses and horrors in its train. Such was the law that assailed me as I pushed to completion with an elderly obstinacy the work of restoring my ancestral home. It, mu not, it must not be imagined for a moment that these tales formed my principal psychological environment. On the other hand, I was constantly praised and encouraged by Captain Norris and the antiquarians who surrounded and aided me. When the task was done, over two years after its commencement, I viewed the great rooms, wainscoted walls, vaulted ceilings, mullioned windows, and broad staircases with a pride which fully compensated for the prodigious expense of the restoration. Every attribute of the Middle Ages was cunningly reproduced, and the new parts blended perfectly with the original walls and foundations. The seat of my father's was complete, and I looked forward to redeeming at last the local frame of the line which ended in me. I would reside here permanently, and prove that a dealer poor, for I have adopted again the original spelling of the name, need not be a fiend. My comfort was perhaps augmented by the fact that, although Exum Priory was medievally fitted, its interior was in truth wholly new and free from old vermin and old ghosts alike. As I have said, I moved in on July the 16th, 1923. My household consisted of seven servants and nine cats, of which latter species I am particularly fond. My eldest cat, Niggerman, was seven years old, and had come with me from my home in Bolton, Massachusetts. The others I had accumulated whilst living with Captain Norris's family during the restoration of the priory. For five days our routine proceeded with the utmost placidity, my time being spent mostly in the codification of old family data I had now obtained, some very circumstantial accounts of the final tragedy and flight of Walter de la Poor, which I conceived to be the probable contents of the hereditary paper lost in the fire at Carfax. It appeared that my ancestor was accused with much reason of having killed all the other members of his household, except four servant confederates, in their sleep, about two weeks after a shocking discovery which changed his whole demeanour, but which, except by implication, he disclosed to no one, save perhaps the servants who assisted him, and afterwards fled beyond reach. This deliberate slaughter, which included a father, three brothers and two sisters, was largely condoned by the villagers, and so slackly treated by the law that its perpetrator escaped honoured, unharmed, and undisguised to Virginia, the general whispered sentiment being that he had purged the land of immemorial curse. What a discovery had prompted an act so terrible, I could scarcely even conjecture. Walter de la Poor must have known for years the sinister tales about his family, so that this material could have given him no fresh impulse. Had he then witnessed some appalling ancient rite, or stumbled upon some frightful and revealing symbol in the priory or its vicinity? He was reputed to have been a shy, gentle youth in England. In Virginia he seemed not so much hard or bitter as harassed and apprehensive. He was spoken of in the diary of another gentleman adventurer, another gentleman adventurer, Francis Harley of Bellevue, as a man of unexampled justice, honour and delicacy. On July 22 occurred the first incident, which, though lightly dismissed at the time, takes on a preternatural significance in relation to later events. It was so simple as to be almost negligible, and could not possibly have been noticed under the circumstances, for it must be recalled that since I was in a building practically fresh and new, except for the walls, 
and surrounded by a well-balanced staff of servitors, apprehension would have been absurd, despite the locality. What I afterward remembered is merely this, that my old black cat, whose moods I knew so well, was undoubtedly alert and anxious to an extent wholly out of keeping with his natural character. He moved from room to room, restless and disturbed, and sniffed constantly about the walls which formed part of the Gothic structure. I realise how trite this sounds, like the inevitable dog in the ghost story, which always growls before his master sees the sheeted figure. Yet I cannot consistently suppress it. The following day a servant complained of restlessness among all the cats in the house. He came to me in my study, a lofty west room on the second story, with groined arches, black oak panelling, and a triple Gothic window overlooking the limestone cliff and desolate valley, and even as he spoke I, see, I saw the jetty form of my black cat creeping along the west wall and scratching at the new panel which overlaid the ancient stone. I told the man that there must be some singular odour or emanation from the old stonework, imperceptible to human senses, but affecting the delicate organs of cats even through the new woodwork. This I truly believed. And when the fellow suggested the presence of mice or rats, I mentioned that there had been no rats there for three hundred years, and that even the field mice of the surrounding country could hardly be found in these high walls, where they had never been known to stray. That afternoon I called on Captain Norris, and he assured me that it would be quite incredible for field mice to infest the priory in such a sudden and unprecedented fashion. <coughs> That night, dispensing as usual with the valet, I retired in the west tower chamber which I had chosen as my own, reached from the study by a stone staircase and short gallery, the former partly ancient, the latter entirely restored. This room was circular, very high and without wainscoting, being hung with arras which I had myself chosen in London. Seeing that my black cat was with me, I shut the heavy gothic door and retired by the light of the electric bulbs which so cleverly counterfeited candles, finally switching off the light and sinking on the carved and canopied four-poster with the venerable cat in his accustomed place across my feet. I did not draw the curtains, but gazed out at the narrow north window which I faced. There was a suspicion of aurora in the sky, and the delicate traceries of the window were pleasantly silhouetted. At some time I must have fallen quietly asleep, for I recall a distinct sense of leaving strange dreams when the cat started violently from his placid position. I saw him in the faint auroral glow, head strained forward, forefeet on my ankles and hind feet stretched behind. He was looking intensely at a point in the wall, somewhat west of the window, a point which to my eye had nothing to mark it, but towards which all my attention was now directed. And as I watched, I knew that the black cat was not vainly excited. Whether the arras actually moved, I cannot say. I think it did, very slightly. But what I can swear to is that behind it I heard a low, distinct scurrying as of rats and mice. In a moment the cat had jumped bodily, on the screening tapestry, bringing the affected section to the floor with his weight, and exposing a damp, ancient wall of stone, patched here and there by the restorers, and devoid of any trace of rodent prowlers. The black cat raced up and down the floor by this part of the wall, clawing the fallen arras, and seemingly trying at times to insert a paw between the wall and the oaken floor. He found nothing, and after a time returned wearily to his place across my feet, I had not moved, but I did not sleep again that night. In the morning I questioned all the servants, and found that none of them had noticed anything unusual, save that the cook remembered the actions of a cat which had rested on her window sill. This cat had howled at some unknown hour of the night, awaking the cook in time for her to see him dart purposefully out of the open door down the stairs. I drowsed away the noontime and in the afternoon called again on Captain Norris, 
who became exceedingly interested in what I told him. The odd incidents, so slight yet so curious, appealed to his sense of the picturesque, and elicited from him a number of reminiscences of local ghostly lore. We were genuinely perplexed at the presence of rats, and Norris lent me some traps and Paris green, which I had the servants place in strategic localities when I returned. <coughs> I retired early, being very sleepy, but was harassed by dreams of the most horrible sort. I seemed to be looking down from an immense height upon a twilit grotto, knee-deep with filth, where a white-bearded demon swineherd drove about with his staff a flock of fungus, flabby beasts, whose appearance filled me with unutterable loathing. Then, as the swineherd, swineherd paused and nodded over his task, a mighty swarm of rats rained down on the stinking abyss and fell to devouring beasts and man alike. From this horrific vision, I was abruptly wakened by the motions of the black cat who had been sleeping as usual across my feet. This time I did not have to question the source of his snarls and hisses, and of the fear which made him sink his claws into my ankle, unconscious of their effect, for on every side of the chamber the walls were alive with nauseous sound, the verminous slithering of ravenous, gigantic, Rats. There was now no aura to show the state of the arras, the falling section of which had been replaced, but I was not too frightened to switch on the light. As the bulbs leapt into radiance, I saw a hideous shaking all over the tapestry, causing the somewhat peculiar designs to execute a singular dance of death. This motion disappeared almost at once, and the sound with it. Springing out of bed, I poked at the arras with the long handle of a warming pan that rested near, and lifted one section to see what lay beneath. There was nothing but the patched stone wall, and even the cat had lost his tense realisation of abnormal presences. When I examined the circular trap that had been placed in the room, I found all of the openings sprung though no trace remained of what had been caught and had escaped. Further sleep was out of the question, so lighting a candle, I opened the door and went out in the gallery towards the stairs to my study, the black cat following at my heels. Before we had, before we had reached the stone steps, however, the cat darted ahead of me and vanished down the ancient flight. As I descended the stairs myself, I became suddenly aware of sounds in the great room below, sounds of a nature which could not be mistaken. The oak-panelled walls were alive with rats, scampering and milling, whilst the black cat was racing about with the fury of a baffled hunter. Reaching the bottom, I switched on the light, which did not this time cause the noise to subside. The rats continued their riot, stampeding with such force and distinctness that I could finally assign to their motions a definite direction. These creatures, in numbers apparently inexhaustible, were engaged in one stupendous migration from inconceivable heights to some depth conceivably or inconceivably below. I now heard steps in the corridor, and in another moment two servants pushed on the massive door. They were searching the house for some unknown source of disturbance which had thrown all the cats into a snarling panic and caused them to plunge precipitately down several flights of stairs and squat, yowling before the closed door to the sub-cellar. I asked them if they had heard the rats, but they replied in the negative and when I turned to call their attention to the sounds in the panels, I realised that the noise had ceased. With the two men, I went down to the door of the sub-cellar, but found the cats already dispersed. Later, I resolved to explore the crypt below, but for the present I merely made a round of the traps. 
all were sprung, yet all were tenantless. Satisfying myself that no one had heard the rats save the felines and me, I sat in my study till morning, thinking profoundly, and recalling every scrap of, le every scrap of legend I had unearthed concerning the building I inhabited. I slept some in the forenoon, leaning back in one of the comfortable library chairs which my, medi which my medieval plan of furnishing could not banish. Later, I telephoned to Captain, Mor Captain Norris, who came over and helped me explore the subcellar. Absolutely nothing untoward was found, although we could not repress a thrill at the knowledge that this vault was built by Roman hands. Every low arch and massive pillar was Roman, not the debased Romanesque of the bungling Saxons, but the severe and harmonious classicism of the age of the Caesars. Indeed, the walls abounded with inscriptions familiar to the antiquarians who had repeatedly explored the place. Things like P. Getai, Prop, Temp, Donna, L. Praecus, Pontificatis. The reference to Artis made me shiver, for I had read Catullus and knew something of the hideous rites of the Eastern god, whose worship was so mixed with that of Sibylli. Norris and I, by the light of the lanterns, tried to interpret the odd and nearly effaced designs on certain irregularly rectangular blocks of stone, generally held to be altars, but could make nothing of them. We remembered that one pattern, a sort of rayed sun, was held by students to imply a non-Roman origin, suggesting that these altars had merely been adopted by the Roman priests from some older and, perhaps, aboriginal temple on the same site. On one of these blocks were some brown stains, which made me wonder. The largest, in the centre of the room, had certain features on the upper surface which indicated its connection with fire, probably burnt offerings. <coughs> Such were the sights in that crypt before whose door the cats howled, and where Norris and I now determined to pass the night. Couches were brought down by the servants, who were told not to mind any nocturnal actions of the cats, and my black cat was admitted as much for help as for companionship. We decided to keep the great oak door, a modern replica with slits for ventilation, tightly closed, and with this attended to, we retired, with lanterns still burning, to await whatever might occur. The vault was very deep in the foundations of the priory, and undoubtedly far down on the face of the beetling limestone cliff overlooking the waste valley. That it had been the goal of the scuffling and unexplainable rats I could not doubt, though why I could not tell. As we lay there expectantly, I found my vigil occasionally mixed with half-formed dreams from which the uneasy motions of the cat across my feet would rouse me. These dreams were not wholesome, but horribly like the one I had had the night before. I saw again the twilight grotto and the swineherd with these unmentionable fungus beasts wallowing in filth and as I looked at these things, they seemed nearer and more distinct, so distinct that I could almost observe their features. Then I did observe the flabby features of one of them, and awakened with such a scream that the black cat started up, whilst Captain Norris, who had not slept, laughed considerably. Norris might have laughed more, or perhaps less, had he known what it was that made me scream. But I did not remember myself till later. Ultimate horror often paralyzes memory in a merciful way. Norris waked me when the phenomena began. Out of the same frightful dream I was called by his gentle shaking and his urging to listen to the cats. Indeed, there was much to listen to for beyond the closed door at the head of the stone steps was a veritable nightmare of fina feline yelling and clawing, whilst my black cat, unmindful of his kindred outside, was running excitedly round the bare stone walls, in which 
I heard the same babble of scurrying rats that had troubled me the night before. An acute terror now rose within me, for here were anomalies which nothing normal could well explain. These rats, if not the creatures of a madness which I shared with the cats alone, must be burrowing and sliding in Roman walls. I had no thought I had thought to be of solid limestone blocks, unless perhaps the action of water running more than seventeen centuries had eaten winding tunnels which rodent bodies had worn clear and ample. But even so, the spectral horror, which was no less, for if these were living vermin, why did not Norris hear their disgusting commotion? Why did he urge me to watch the black cat and listen to the cats outside? And why did he guess wildly and vaguely at what could have aroused them? <clears throat> By the time I had managed to tell him, as rationally as I could, what I thought I was hearing, my ears gave me the last fading impression of the scurrying which had retreated still downward, far underneath this deepest of sub-cellars, till it seemed as if the whole cliff below were riddled with questing rats. Norris was not as sceptical as I, I had anticipated, but instead seemed profoundly moved. He motioned me to notice that the cats at the door had ceased their clamour, as if giving up the rats for lost, whilst my black cat had a burst of renewed restlessness and was clawing frantically around the bottom of the large stone altar in the centre of the room, which was nearer Norris's couch than mine. <coughs> Cup of tea. My fear of the unknown was at this point very great. Something astounding had occurred, and I saw Captain Norris, a younger, stouter, and presumably more naturalistically materialistic man, was affected fully as much as myself, perhaps because of his lifelong and intimate familiarity with local legend. We could, for the moment, do nothing but watch the old black cat as he poured with decreasing fervour at the base of the altar, occasionally looking up and mewing to me in that persuasive manner which he used when he wished me to perform some favour for him. Norris now took a lantern close to the altar and examined the place where the black cat was pawing, silently kneeling and scraping away the lichens of the centuries which joined the massive pre-Roman block to the tessellated floor. He did not find anything, and was about to abandon his efforts when I noticed a trivial circumstance which made me shudder, even though it implied nothing more than I had already imagined. I told him of it, and we both looked at its almost imperceptible manifestation with the fixedness of fascinated discovery and acknowledgement. It was only this, that the flame of the lantern set down near the altar was slightly but certainly flickering, from a draught of air which it had not before received, and which came indubitably from the crevice between the floor and altar where Norris was scraping away the lichen. We spent the rest of the night in the brilliantly lighted study, nervously discussing what we should do next. The discovery that some vault deeper than the deepest known masonry of the, Ro masonry of the Romans underlay this accursed pile some vault unsuspected by the curious antiquarians of three centuries would have been sufficient to excite us without any background of the sinister. As it was, the fascination became twofold, and we paused in doubt whether to abandon our search and quit the priory forever in superstitious caution, or to gratify our sense of adventure and brave whatever horrors might await us in the unknown depths. By morning we had compromised and decided to go to London to gather a group of archaeologists and scientific men fit to cope with the mystery. <coughs> it should be mentioned that before leaving the sub-cellar we had vainly tried to move the central altar 
which we now recognized as the gate to a new pit of nameless fear. What secret would open the gate wiser men than we would have to find? During many days in London, Captain Norris and I presented our facts, conjectures, and legendary anecdotes to five eminent authorities, all men who could be trusted to respect any family disclosures which future explorations might develop. We found most of them little disposed to scoff, but instead intensely interested and sincerely sympathetic. It is hardly necessary to name them all, but I may say that they included Sir William Brinton, whose, excava whose excavations in the Troad excited most of the world in their day. As we all took the train for Anchester, I felt myself poised on the brink of frightful revelations, a sensation symbolised by the air of mourning among the many Americans at the unexpected death of the President on the other side of the world. On the evening of August 7th, we reached Exham Priory, where the servants assured me that nothing unusual had occurred. The cats, even my old black cat, had been perfectly placid, and not a trap in the house had been sprung. We were to begin exploring on the following day, awaiting which I, awaiting which I assigned well-appointed rooms to all my guests. I myself retired in my own tower chamber, with my black cat across my feet. Sleep came quickly, but hideous dreams assailed me. There was a vision of a Roman feast, like that of Trimalchio, with a horror in a covered platter. Then came that damnable, recurrent thing about the swineherd and his filthy drove in the twilight grotto. Yet, when I awoke, it was full daylight, with normal sounds in the house below. The rats, living or spectral, had not troubled me and the black cat was still quietly asleep. On going down, I found that the same tranquillity had prevailed elsewhere, and a condition which one of the assembled savants, a fellow named Thornton, devoted to the psychic, rather absurdly lay to the fact I had now shown the thing which certain forces, forces rather absurdly lay to the fact that I had now been shown the thing which certain forces had wished to show me. It was now ready, and at 11 a.m. our entire group of seven men bearing powerful electric searchlights and implements of excavation went down to the subcellar and bolted the door behind us. My old black cat was with us, with us, for the investigators found no occasion to despise his excitability, and were indeed anxious that he be present in case of obscure rodent manifestations. We noted the Roman inscriptions, and unknown altar designs only briefly, for three of the savants had already seen them, and all knew their characteristics. Prime attention was paid to the momentous central altar, and within, a, within an hour Sir William Brinton had caused it to tilt backward, balanced by some unknown species of counterweight. There now lay revealed such a horror as would have overwhelmed us had we not been prepared. Through a nearly square opening in the tiled floor, sprawling on a flight of stone steps so prodigiously worn that it was little more than an inclined plane at the centre, was a ghastly array of human or semi-human bones. <coughs> Those which retained their collocation as skeletons showed attitudes of panic fear, and over all were the marks of rodent gnawing. The skulls denoted nothing short of utter idiocy, cretinism, or primitive semi apedom Above the hellishly littered steps arched a descending passage, seemingly chiselled from the solid rock, and conducting a current of air. This current was not a sudden and noxious rush as from a closed vault, but a cool breeze, with something of freshness in it. We did not pause long, but shiveringly began to clear a passage down the steps. It was then that Sir William, examining the hewn walls, made the odd observation that the passage, according to the direction of the strokes, must have been chiselled from beneath. I must be very deliberate now, 
and choose my words. After ploughing down a few steps amidst the gnawed bones, we saw that there was light ahead, not any mystic phosphorescence, but a filtered daylight which could not come except from unknown fishes in the cliff that overlooked the waste valley. That such fishes had escaped notice from outside was hardly remarkable, for not only is the valley wholly uninhabited, but the cliff is so high and beetling that only an aeronaut could study its face in detail. A few steps more, and our breaths were literally snatched from us by what we saw. So literally that Thornton, the psychic investigator, actually fainted in the arms of the dazed man who stood behind him. Norris, his plump face, utterly white and flabby, simply cried out inarticulately, whilst I think that what I did was to gasp or hiss and cover my eyes. The man behind me, the only one of the party older than I, croaked the hackneyed, My God, in the most cracked voice I ever heard. Of seven cultivated men, only Sir William Brinton retained his composure, a thing the more to his credit because he led the party and must have seen the sight first. It was a twilit grotto of enormous height, stretching away farther than any eye could see, a subterranean world of limitless mystery and horrible suggestion. There were buildings and other architect there were buildings and other architectural remains. In one terrified glance I saw a weird pattern of tumuli, a savage circle of monoliths, a low domed Roman ruin, a sprawling Saxon pile, and an early English edifice of wood. But all these were dwarfed by the ghoulish spectacle presented by the general surface of the ground. For yards about the steps extended an insane tangle of human bones, or bones at least as human as those on the steps. Like a foamy sea they stretched, some fallen apart, but others wholly or partly articulated the skeletons. <coughs> These latter, invariably in postures of demoniac frenzy, either fighting off some menace or clutching other forms with cannibal intent. When Dr. Trask, the anthropologist, stopped to classify the skulls, he found a degraded mixture which utterly baffled him. They were mostly lower than the Piltdown man in the scale of evolution, but in every case definitely human. Many were of higher grade, and a very few were the skulls of supremely and sensitively developed types. All the bones were gnawed, mostly by rats, but somewhat by others of the half-human drove. Mixed with them were many tiny bones of rats, fallen members of the lethal army which closed the ancient epic. I wonder that any man among us lived or kept his sanity through that hideous day of discovery. Not Hoffman or Huysmans could convince a scene more wildly incredible, more frenetically repellent, or more gothically grotesque than the twilit grotto through which we seven staggered, each stumbling on revelation after revelation and trying to keep for the nonce from thinking of the events which must have taken place there three hundred or a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand years ago. It was the antechamber of hell. And poor Thornton fainted again when Trask told him that some of the skeleton things must have descended as quadrupeds through the last twenty or more generations. Horror piled upon horror as we began to interpret the architectural remains. The quadruped things, with their occasional recruits from the biped class, had been kept in stone pens, out of which they must have broken in their last delirium of hunger or rat fear. There had been great herds of them, evidently fattened on the coarse vegetables whose remains could be found as a sort of poison ensilage at the bottom of huge stone bins older than Roman. I knew now why my ancestors had had such excessive gardens. Would to heaven 
I could forget. The purpose of the herds I did not have to ask. Sir William, standing with his searchlight in the Roman ruin, translated aloud the most shocking ritual I have ever known and told of the diet of the antediluvian cult which the priests of Sibylle found and mingled with their own. Norris, used as he was to the trenches, could not walk straight when he came out of the English building. It was a butcher shop and a kitchen. He had expected that, but it was too much to see familiar English implements to such a place and read, and read familiar English graffiti there, some as recent as 1610. I could not go into that building. That building, whose demon activities were stopped only by the dagger of my ancestor, Walter de la Poor. What I did venture to enter was the low Saxon building whose oaken door had fallen, and there I found a terrible row of ten stone cells with rusty bars. Three had tenants, all skeletons of high grade, and on the bony forefinger of one I found a seal ring with my own coat of arms. Sir William found a vault with far older cells below the Roman chapel, but these cells were empty. Below them was a low crypt with cases of formerly arranged bones, some of them bearing terrible parallel inscriptions carved in Latin, Greek, and the tongue of Phrygia. Meanwhile, Dr. Trask had opened one of the prehistoric tumuli and brought to light skulls which were slightly more than a gorilla's and which bore indescribable ideographic carvings. Through all this horror my cat stalked unperturbed. Once I saw him monstrously perched atop a mountain of bones and wondered at the secrets that might lie behind his yellow eyes. Having grasped to some slight degree the frightful revelations of this twilight area, an area so hideously foreshadowed by my, rec by my recurrent dreams, we turned to that apparently boundless depth of midnight cavern when no ray of light from the cliff could penetrate. We shall never know what sightless Stygian worlds yawn below the little distance we went, for it was decided that such secrets are not good for mankind. But there was plenty to engross us close to hand, for we had not gone far before the searchlights showed that accursed infinity of pits in which the rats had feasted and whose sudden lack of replenishment had driven the ravenous rodent army first to turn on the living herds of starving things, and then to burst forth from the priory in that historic orgy of devastation which the peasants will never forget. God, those carrion black pits of sword-picked bones and open skulls, those nightmare chasms choked with the pithecanthropoid, Celtic, Roman, and English bones of countless unhallowed centuries. Some of them were full, and none can say how deep they had once been. Others were still bottomless to our searchlights and peopled by unnameable fancies. What I thought of the hapless rats that stumbled into such traps amidst the blackness of their quest in this grisly Tartarus. Once my foot slipped near a horribly yawning brink, and I had a moment of ecstatic fear. I must have been musing a long time, for I could not see any of the party but the plump Captain Norris. Then there came a sound from that inky, boundless farther distance that I thought I knew, and I saw my old black cat dart past me like a winged Egyptian god straight into the illimitable gulf of the unknown. But I was not far behind, for there was no doubt after another second. It was the eldritch scurrying of those fiend-born rats. always questing for new horrors 
and determined to lead me on even unto those grinning caverns of the earth's centre where Nealothotep, the mad, faceless god, howls blindly in the darkness to the piping of two amorphous idiot flute players. My searchlight expired, but still I ran. I heard voices and yowls and echoes, but above all there gently rose that impious, insidious scurrying, gently rising, rising, as a stiff, bloated corpse gently rises above an oily river that flows under endless onic bridges to a black, putrid sea. Something bumped into me, something soft and plump. It must have been the rats, the viscous, gelatinous, ravenous army that feast on the dead and the living. Why shouldn't rats eat a dealer poor as a dealer poor eats forbidden things? The war ate my boy, damn them all, and the Yanks ate Carfax with flames and burnt Grand Delapore, and the secret. No, no, I tell you, I am not that demon swineherd heard in the twilight grotto. I was not Edward Norris's fat face on that flabby fungus thing. Who says I am a Dillapur? He lived, but my boy died. Shall a Norris hold the lands of a Dillapur? It's voodoo, I tell you, that spotted snake. Curse you, Thornton, I'll teach you to faint at what my family do. Splud, thou stinkard, I learn ye how to gust. Would ye swink me thilka ways, magna mater, magna mater, atis, dia adai ta erden, agus has dunach ort, ronus rollus ort, agus latsa, ungi, ungi, rlch, chach. That is what they say, I said, when they found me in the blackness after three hours, found me crouching in the blackness after the plump, half-eaten body of Captain Norris, with my own cat leaping and tearing at my throat. Now they have blown up Exum Priory, taken my black cat away from me, and shut me into this barred room at Hanwell with fearful whispers about my hereditary and experience. Thornton is in the next room, but they prevent me from talking to him. They are trying, too, to suppress most of the facts concerning the Priory. When I speak of poor Norris, they accuse me of a hideous thing. But they must know that I did not do it. They must know it was the rats, the slithering, scurrying rats, whose scampering will never let me sleep. The demon rats that race behind the padding in this room and beckon me down to greater horrors than I have ever known. The rats, they can never hear. The rats. The rats in the wall.